It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We've got a great panel for you. Alex Wilhelm's in studio visiting us from Queens. Steve Kovac, he's at Business Insider. From Quartz.com and Brooklyn, we got Mike Murphy. We're going to talk about big quarterly results for Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, and Google's Alphabet. Who's the big winner? You might be surprised. The biggest breach of government info in history. It came out of Sweden. And the Bitcoin fork. We'll try to explain what that all means. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 625, recorded Sunday, July 30th, 2017. Walking to the Bodega. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Hover. Finding the perfect domain name is incredibly easy with Hover. Go to hover.com slash twit and save 10% off your first purchase. And by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet easy to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobostore.com to learn more and use the code TWIT10 to save 10% off selected Drobos, including the new Drobo 5D3. And by Carbonite. Keep your business safe this year. Protect your business from ransomware and hacker attacks with automatic cloud backup from Carbonite. Try it free at Carbonite.com. Use the offer code TWIT to get two free bonus months if you decide to buy. And by WordPress. WordPress powers 28% of all websites, including mine. Get 15% off your new website at WordPress.com slash TWIT. That's WordPress.com slash TWIT. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the latest tech news. Oh, I'm sorry you weren't here for earlier. But uh, <clears throat> this week we're going to get very serious with a fabulous panel. The uh, editor-in-chief of the brand new Crunchbase News is here, Alex Wilhelm. Alex Will Wilhelm. Yes, that's my new official Twit nickname, I think. Yes, you're gonna, yeah. we're going to put it in quotes in then between your Next name. time I'm on, it'll be done correctly, but today we'll go with that. Editor-in-chief at the uh, Crunchbase News. How's that going, by the way, your new... Uh, it's going good. Gig, yeah? That's yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. So far, I'm not fired, at least, you know. Senior correspondent for Business Insider, Steve, it's not time to buy an iPhone. Kovac is also here. <laughs> Good to have How's you. How's it going? Great. Steve is in Queens. Queens, yes. Yes. Long Island City, which is, despite the name, is actually Queens. It's the new Brooklyn, I understand. Yes. And from Brooklyn, which is the old Queens, Mike's not happy, Mike Murphy <laughs> from Quartz. <laughs> Uh, hi, Mike. Good to see you. Hey. Yeah. First time on Twitter. You've been, on, of course, on the network many, many times on TNT. We're glad to have you. Uh, this was. This is actually. It's good to have Alex here. Actually, all of you, because you all cover business to some degree. Because this was a very busy week for quarterly results. Yes. Facebook, Alphabet slash Google. Uh, I still have to say that, don't I? Because if I say Alphabet, people say, "What's that?" <laughs> I feel like in six more months, we can stop saying that. And yeah. the Times doesn't have to say Waymo, a company of part of the Alphabet family, which right. also owns Google. Maybe. It's too many words. You know, it's know. complex. Uh, who else uh, announced a, a quarter? Amazon. 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 Wow, that's kind of Twitter. three. Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> you had to bring up Twitter, didn't you, Mike? You had to bring up. So Twitter uh, had the dubious uh, honor of being able to announce zero growth. <laughs> <laughs> they they lit did they is it literally they had zero new users is that it's a net MAU net flatline yeah. right ah uh, wow but they said but there's a bright sign because people are using it more often daily daily active users went up we're talking about monthly active users which was flat do we agree that Twitter makes more sense to be judged on a DAU basis over an MAU basis Twitter does they think you're, you know engagement is more important than new signups. Probably, but right? I, I think Snapchat should also report, or sorry, Snap should also report MAUs, but I think Twitter promoting DAUs isn't as bad a dodge the, as it would appear originally. I don't, it doesn't it doesn't bother me that much. It seems weird, though, that they say that their DAUs are up, and then they're like, well, we're not going to tell you how many DAUs we have, though. Yeah, they wouldn't say. <laughs> they're being coy. Because so up could be like five more people. I mean, it doesn't have to be, a, they said up a lot, right? But what is a lot? Yeah. Like? Yeah. Well, Wall Street didn't buy it, as we'll see later. Yeah, stocks went down. Well, you don't have to see it later. You're going to see it now. The stock went down. Um, 
Every time Twitter's stock goes down, which seems to happen a lot, it put does it put it in play? Is it mean somebody's going to come along and buy it, or is it already so tainted that nobody's going to is even looking at it anymore? Or are they just it's waiting? Tainted. It's got to get way lower down, before someone really buys it. Yeah, so it's just not low enough yet. Right. It's twelve and a half billion, I think, roughly right now. So presuming like a thirty percent premium, you're looking at fifteen, sixteen. It's a lot of money. Yeah, but not it's worth it. But it's where the president <laughs> announces <laughs> policy. I mean, it's uh, it's the new White House briefing room. The new well, that's White the irony House about Twitter, isn't it? Where so much news happens. I mean, this is an old analysis here, and a lot of people have said this before, but still. A lot of news happens on Twitter. Uh, the, the president literally now dictates policy on Twitter, um, and that gets picked up by every other media organization who sees the benefit of it, maybe more so than Twitter does. So that's like their big problem. They have this very valuable platform from a news perspective, but they don't know how to really take advantage of that. And they're still being valued as a social media tech company when they're really more of a media company. Well, that's the interesting thing. I mean, they're really putting, uh, you know, when I go to the front page now, I see live video streaming. They're basically going to do a live channel, right? This is on the right. It's stadium, which I guess is a sports thing, but they're going to do, Neil Patel is going to do a tech show, a gadget show. Mm -hmm. They're going to have their own content. How does that tie in to what Twitter is? It doesn't. It seems like a second business almost. How does that help Twitter with monthly active users? It doesn't help it with me because I don't want to watch video on Twitter. No, I go to Twitter, and I presume most people use Twitter. It's it's a feed of news, right? Of information, not video, but of textual information and links. It somebody somebody wrote a tweet to me uh, the other day that said it's uh, ironically. Uh, I was a big RSS fan for a year. I'm still an RSS fan. I said that Twitter is what killed RSS, right? Yeah. Twitter became your did. feed. Yeah. Twitter also became the new comment section for all online articles. I mean, this is why no one really needs to have discuss or discuss at the bottom of their post anymore because we all go on Twitter to talk about the stuff. We don't leave comments behind. We put them into the conversation. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean Twitter is good from a financial perspective. The revenue is down. Um, I think it was last quarter. I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but, you know, and they dropped 13, 14 points after that. Tough day for the little blue bird. I, you know, it's funny. I come and go on Twitter at times. I hate it. Uh, I think they definitely have a, you know, their their free speech policy creates a, a problem for them in terms of content. And yet, uh, I would hate to not have it. Yeah. You guys agree? I mean, I bet you uh, all four of us visit Twitter daily, at least. Too oh, often. I'm glued to it all day. Glued to it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> for, Social for scientists journal, would like say that's what's wrong with you, right? That, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's an, um, you're causing a problem. I'm I'm looking at it right now as we talk. I still I have my tweet deck <laughs> open. Oh. Yeah, same. At least that's honest. I mean, I just got um, one of those 43 inch Dell monitors at the office, and I have tweet deck now, like this epically huge. Okay, display. let me. It's okay, so great. Let's talk tweet deck hygiene. Okay. Uh, what do you have? What are your tweet deck columns? I have home mentions. Messages and Donald Trump. That's it? <laughs> That's the least hygienic I've ever seen. That's yeah, like germs really? all over your face. Isn't feet. that what you want? Isn't that what you, you want? You need the activity column. The activity column yeah. is the best column you can oh, add. Oh, let me on add. Twitter. Let me add a column for uh, activity. What you is? You can learn a lot. You can learn a lot about people. It shows you what people you follow are faving and like a whole bunch of who they follow and all kinds oh, of stuff. Oh, and it scrolls yeah. fast too. I should probably close my messages. Yeah, I was going to say that. Really. You know, Jason would appreciate <laughs> it. Uh, but. Um, Vacuum sealed my memory foam mattress with a mattress bag and lots of packaging tape filed under stupid DIY ideas at work. Well, I'm so glad I saw that tweet. Was that a Trump tweet? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a matter of time. No, it was too coherent. My problem, well, I don't have that problem. I have a problem with Twitter in general is, I, and I've mentioned this before, I feel like I'm having a stroke when I read it. I don't, it's like, uh, what? I, you have to spend so much time parsing it, but you guys live on Twitter. You probably, it's just like, it's, it's a right. new language, right? It's like looking at the matrix. Yes. You know, <laughs> it's data. It's just like that. Yeah. Data coming down like rain. Okay. Which is why so, like, video you keep tweet deck. Sense. You, Mike, you keep tweet deck open. Steve, yeah. you keep tweet deck open. Alex, yeah. you keep tweet deck open. I use tweeting. Like Dude, Twill yeah. Twill Tweetin? No, Tweetin. He was in Star Trek. He would, that was Will Wheaton, oh. not Twill Tweetin. <laughs> Wheat, what is Tweetin? T W E E T I N? T E N. Uh, it's at Tweetin app on Twitter. It's a tweet deck variant that you can still run as a desktop application, both on Mac and Windows 10. And but it's like it's it's similar with columns. Oh, it is a tweet deck rip. 
but it is a desktop app, unlike TweetDeck, which is now a web client. If I yeah, I don't. So yeah, I have to keep my browser open to do TweetDeck. Yeah, so. so this is the best tool that I that I found. It's a little bit less memory intensive than old TweetDeck desktop was. Um, and I run a lot of columns, so it's a big memory hog, but I, I think it's the best way to go about it. So this is what I, I, I use it too, but it's kind of janky. I found like I, I even added them. I'm like, Hey, this is a great idea, but the screen keeps flashing and giving me like, I feel like I'm going to have a stroke and they're like, Oh yeah, we're looking into it. And that was like a month ago. And so I just went back to tweet deck. I'm on their Slack group, their Slack channel, wherever, wherever it's called. If you send me over your feedback, I'll pass it along to them after the show. Uh, shame. It, shame. Shame. Now you have to get naked and walk through the streets of... Uh, oh, that's why Kovac is here. Oh, okay. Westeros. <laughs> uh, uh, by the way, episode three, Game of Thrones, we only got three more episodes. What the hell? We just, Wait, got, we just got it back. I think it's seven episodes. Seven? Oh, right? good. Four. Crap. <laughs> One month, we're gonna, it's, we have to wait again. Is there another season coming? Yeah, it's ha they split it in half. Oh, I hate my that. gosh. I hate it when they do that. Anyway, back to TweetDeck. <laughs> <laughs> this has been What's on Leo's Mind. What the hell's on my mind? I'm becoming, this is what happens when you look at Twitter all the time. You become discursive. I, I'll close it. Watch this. It's gone. No, it's not. It's you just reduced it. It's behind that you other window. You can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> you are addicts, you gentlemen. Uh, um, but it's good. It makes us better at our jobs. I mean, if you are on Twitter that much, you can't fall too far behind. If you, Oh, well, that's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So but, if Twitter did not exist, we would have to invent it. We would yes. do a lot less. I feel like I wouldn't. I'd just be on Facebook more. Uh. <laughs> yeah. So why not Facebook? Facebook is not a news feed now. It's uh, changed. It's not. It's, it's too algorithmic. I actually have multiple times in the last week tried to go back and turn it into, you know, most recent you know, messages from your friends. It's frustrating. And it? it keeps going back to, yeah. to, you know, the top, whatever they think is the most important stuff, which is like three days old. And it's like, you can't use that in any kind of like news capacity. I just feel manipulated. Like, like this is Zuckerberg's, you know, platform. In fact, that's why I'm worried about him running for president. No. It's basically a knob under his desk become president. And he just, he just tweaks that and the feed changes and suddenly he's, everybody loves Zuck and he's got all the votes and it's over. He's, Isn't that really the risk that fa of Facebook? He may be the most Two powerful billion person users? on the planet that doesn't have nukes. He doesn't <laughs> need nukes. He's got Facebook. I, I understand. I'm just saying, putting aside people that are nuclear powers, I think Zuck may be the most powerful person Kim because Jong he can control Un would opinion. love, forget ICBMs, he needs Facebook. So let's talk about Facebook's results. They had a very good quarter. They did. Like, very, <laughs> like, when don't they have a good quarter? When have they had a bad quarter? They haven't. They've beaten yeah. every single time since they've been public. Beaten by, in, in the sense, beat the analysts' expectations. Yeah. You would think the analysts would then update their expectations so they wouldn't get beat. Well, the thing is, well, Facebook case, should be showing slowing growth. Right? It's funny because Apple always sandbags and and beats expectations by lowering expectations, and then they stopped doing that. Though they said years ago they were going to they stopped doing they stopped that. Doing they, that? You can kind of yeah, you can see the gap narrowing between. Uh, they don't get beat as much. The, the guidance, yeah, they, they don't, don't get beat as much as, much as the, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but they, the they, analysts they get beat with Facebook. Do you think Facebook's doing the same thing or just analysts can't believe how successful they are? Facebook literally has said for the last year that they're going to, that there is going to come a point in 2017 where they're not going to be able to make as much as they have. <laughs> they run out of but, people. They just yeah, run out of I mean, people. They're going to run out of people on the internet, especially with a good enough connection, which is why they have the crazy drones and things like that. Yes. But they keep saying that the earnings are going to drop at some point and then they post their best quarter ever by a country mile. It's... 47% growth in rev and advertising revenue year over year. Yep. That's unbelievable. 45% uh, growth in total revenue. Now, costs went up a lot. Why did costs go up a third? Facebook has hired as many people as it can possibly find that meet its criteria. Yeah. I mean, the hiring boom that's going on that's created a talent war between the biggest five tech companies uh, continues. And especially in, um, in the Bay Area. It's also very bad in Seattle, but I think it's still concentrated here. We're running out of people. Run out of people. In many respects. Now, I don't look at it the same way you do. You're more financial focused because of crunch base. <clears throat> to me, the one number I always look at is net income. Like how, do they make money, right? Maybe that's just like a normal person thinks about that. <laughs> yeah. They Facebook, made money. Their Facebook net income's up 71%. They're an amazingly they profitable almost corporation. almost doubled their profits. That's incredible. Facebook has been profitable for a very long time. So if you go back to when Facebook filed to go public, they had a billion dollars in trailing profits before they went public. 
their operating margin is almost 50%. That means that's sick. That means for every dollar they make, they keep forty-seven cents. For every dollar they spend, they outside of capital expenses like uh, data a building. Funds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but I mean, that's why they're worth so much money. I mean, they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's probably pretty fair. The question then becomes, I think, Steve's point: when the revenue growth does decelerate enough to become material, how does the company approach shareholder uh, wealth? And do they start doing dividends or buybacks? Oh, who cares about rate? that? I don't care about well, that. me. I, I, care. I don't. Who cares about that? Shareholders care about that. Uh, that's all shareholders ever want. That's what's killing Apple is the shareholders say, pay me, pay me, pay me. Is that what's killing Apple? That's what's, well, and, um, yeah, okay. Okay. But I think it's one of the things. Uh, can you convince me as to why? Yes, because they have $200 billion in the bank and they won't spend it except to buy back shares. No, no. They're well, borrowing, they they're, and they're bo well, they're borrowing against it to buy back shares, yeah. but they're borrowing to, to buy back shares. That's purely shareholder interest. That's not in the interest of Apple. Apple should take that money and spend it and and find a new business because they're running out of they're also running out of people who are going to buy iPhones and that's their only business at this point. Anyway, that's an they Apple. They could build discussion. more buildings. Yeah. Oh my God, we're going to get to that building because really uh, the Wall Street Journal article this week was very interesting. There was some stuff buried in there that may show some little trouble in the spaceship paradise there. But first, I want to keep going with the Facebook here. Yes. Effective tax rate. I always look at this too. Again, I'm not an analyst. Thirteen percent. What do you pay for your tax? Uh, I pay a lot more than 13%. 40%? I pay almost half in taxes? Yeah. 13%. Smart accountants. Nice work if you can get it. 1.32 billion daily active users. That's the number that caught me. That I had forgotten it had gotten to be that large. That's an insane stat. That's what one, one fifth of the planet every day looks on the Every Facebook. day. And frankly, uh, let's think about it. Probably a billion of those spend more than half an hour on Facebook. Like, spend a Wait, long time well, on let's Facebook. Let's pull the team here. Kovac, how much time per day do you spend on Facebook? Uh, a few minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like, me neither. Not, I don't know. Facebook, lot. but see, we're, so that's really interesting how much we use Twitter. Mm. Mike, are you a Facebook? You spend more than a minute or two on Facebook a day? No, I, oh. I mean, it's, you know, checking family and friends sort of thing. See, everyone's still alive. You made, that, it. You made that point, an excellent point that. Facebook's algorithm algorithmic feed means you're not you're seeing something. Well, okay, Facebook must have noticed that I was talking about this National Review article because it put it right on the top. That's some next level. That's AI. scary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's Ian Thompson. Uh, that's good. Mark Canner. Uh, he put a fake news story up earlier this morning, so I'm going to unfollow him. Uh, but you're, you're scrolling. Do you care about any of this? No, Isn't none this, of this. But look at that late, late Sunday. What's the problem here? If you compare this, look how much. Okay, look how much real estate my friend Ray used with this meaningless post, right? Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, you can use a pen if you want to write. Let's do a little. Uh, and <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> and and then and then go back and look at TweetDeck and how much richness there is in uh you know uh, on the page i guess that's if you're looking for information density is that what we're looking for personally yes it's a, it's a hard argument though i mean you know in some cases yeah you are you know we're journalists we want to know as much information as possible in the most efficient way but if you're like my mom on facebook and just like hanging out looking at old photos of you know, what me and my sister are doing or something like that. You don't necessarily want to jam it with stuff. Yeah, that's interesting. She's, she's, it's, most people probably like pictures, right? Yeah. Visual contents. Big. I go to TweetDeck. It's not, it's a lot of text. There's some pictures, but there's, mo it's mostly text. That's probably but, Trump though. He's not helping that. Yeah. <laughs> Donald embedded, he did one picture the other day. I was, I was blown away. I said, somebody's teaching him how to use. There it is. He, he <laughs> embedded a video. Big. That wasn't and, him. That, yeah, was, that was, that was Kavino, someone else. Right? And he even, yeah, he oh. even, somebody, he used the video emoji. Like, this is a video. I was like, Donald. No, no, it's Dan. Dan's Kavino. It's Dan. His social media yeah. guy. Which so is, Dan has real Donald Trump as well as POTUS? I guess so. Yeah. Well, I think Trump dictates a lot of these. I don't think he sits down in front of TweetDeck on his own computer and types out a message on his laptop. Are you sure, Kofifi? Uh, maybe <laughs> Sean oh, Spicer had a couple too many. So yeah, the ones that are misspelled, the ones that have grammar errors or like weird spacing that doesn't make any sense or like, weird capitalization of nouns those are our president you know one way to know what did, so he used an iphone to post the most recent one that's probably not him right that's dan no, yeah because well, he, he uses, has an iphone now too oh he has, no, an, he iPhone. has an iphone he's back now. to the iphone yeah. he has an iphone with one app and that one app is twitter is that true <laughs> i think i yeah. read that article yeah <gasps> <laughs> they gave so him. they got rid of the galaxy s3 <laughs> or whatever yeah security 
Um, oh, yeah, these are all from iPhone now. I mean, it's DEF CON week. Are you saying Android isn't secure? <laughs> it's more secure than it used to be. Yeah. So if, is Windows XP. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are all iPhone now. Okay, well, my old trick of looking at what the platform was is no longer good. <clears throat> so back to uh, Facebook. Yeah. Did we said everything there is to do? A mobile advertising revenue? Get this. Remember when Facebook, we were always wondering... You know, can they can they go from desktop revenue and advertising to that very difficult nut to crack mobile advertise eighty seven percent of their revenues mobile advertising. I guess they cracked that nut. Just a little bit. Holy cow. Do we Headcount. Know? You were saying that one of the expenditures was people went up forty three percent. There you go. There you go. And you know, when Apple goes up, you know they're hiring people for the store. When Amazon, Amazon's went up like crazy, but that you know they're just putting people uh, pickers. It's all pickers in the in the fulfillment centers, right? And they crossed uh, two billion monthly active users, which is insane. I buried the lead. You buried the lead a little bit. We kind of did it last, but uh, two billion MAUs for Facebook. You're not talking about video, though. Video is their next big growth opportunity. At least that's how they view it. They think they can scrape some of those ad dollars away from television. And so they're doing those original shows and, and partnering with other media companies to do some kind of like short form original programming. Um, so that's going to be an interesting experiment to watch next quarter. Total TV ad by... In the U.S.? In the U.S., it's like $100 billion. It's a lot. Are we playing guess, or are you asking me no, if I know? I'm trying, I was asking if you know, but I, I'm trying to find it. It's $113 billion as of fiscal 2015. It's, I made that up. Don't look at me like that. It's so authoritative. <laughs> you what sounded like you knew what you're talking about. If That's you authority. say fiscal or material in a sentence yeah. about finance, everyone uh, will think you're talking about Is this material. gap or non-gap? Uh, excuse me, is that a net number? <laughs> uh, or is that a gross debt metric? Um, uh, chat room will find it for me. Just a chat room, little research. How much was spent in the United States on television ads this year, I, I know, I know it was in that ball. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, and of course, people are looking at, you know, TV watching. Your numbers aren't going down a lot, but people are looking at new ways to advertise. So, what Facebook said, we're going to spend like a hundred million. We're going to spend as much as a million a minute, or three million a minute. What it was? Wait, a, three million a minute? It was a lot of money. What, what was it? No, three million for ten minutes. That's uh, what it was. We're going to okay. willing to spend as much as three. They're all short form, right? Is that right, Steve? Mm. They're all short form. For now, and then they're going to go long form and have, you know, traditional 30-minute, hour-long shows as well. And they'll be episodic, serialized, fictional stuff? Or That's what it, it sounds like, yeah. It sounds like they're doing going that I mean, just, you know, just like Apple's noodling around with doing that, and we've seen Amazon do it, and of course Netflix is doing it. Snapchat's even experimenting with doing reality TV. It's all these platforms... Uh, seem to have learned that if they dump enough money uh, into content, they can get at least some hits. Well, but you can screw it up. Apple's kind of screwed it up, right? Are you saying oh Planet of the Apps isn't good? <laughs> How dare you say <laughs> that? Hired, they, hired those two, they, they hired those two guys, some two big fancy Hollywood dudes who are going to apparently turn all that around. So Yeah, the um, guys from AMC. You know, Planet, yeah, so Planet of the Apps was, you know, yeah, it's terrible, but that doesn't mean moving forward they're not taking it more seriously and, again, dumping well, like, loads of money into it. If that's what you thought, like your big strategy is we're going to go into video and you, Apple, one of the largest companies in the world, that was what you came up with? That's what you think the average person is going to want to watch? Like there's an issue. There's oh, a yeah. sy systemic issue there beyond bringing in some good producers like that you're that tone deaf to like what people actually care about? I don't know. It just seems strange. Are you talking about Planet of the Apps or you're talking about hiring, uh, whatchamacallit, those no, AMC guys? No, before that. I mean, like, maybe that's why they oh, hired yeah, them. You're totally they right. realized they're so hilariously bad at producing content. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, like, no, the I mission, exactly but the mission for Apple Video is very different than the mission for Facebook or Twitter Video. The mission for Apple Video is just to up subscriptions to Apple Music, period, right? Correct. For now. Yeah. Well, but Facebook wants ad revenue. Apple's not looking at ad revenue. Yeah. No. Facebook wants to create something that will take... By the way, we've got the numbers. Thank you, chat room. I'm blowing them up now. Uh, mm. The ad revenue... America's ad spend... Uh, $72 billion. In 2016. Thanks oh, it'll be the same, even though there's no Olympics, so there's no growth there. Thanks to PDO in the chat room. But PDO came up with an interesting number. Digital ad spend was almost the same. Wow. Okay, I didn't know they Which were at already. Me. That surprised me a lot. So Facebook, it's reasonable for Facebook to say, well, we there's no reason why we can't get at least half of that $70 billion right now, right? 
Well, they need to have a new revenue source. So if they can tap into it, Viva, but it's going to be a much more expensive revenue stream than the stuff we talked about. They're not going to be able to have you know op margins of fifty percent after dropping that much money for ten minutes of content. I don't think. I don't. But that's know why the they're economics. partnering with people. That's why they're partnering with other media companies to make this. It's cheap. You know, they can do a little bit of a rev share, and it's relatively cheap. A lot of the cost goes on those media companies. To Who's done the best make. of this? Is is it Netflix? That's the Paragon or Amazon? Oh, Netflix. Both. Netflix Amazon. is the best, but Amazon's pretty good too. Revenue yeah, wise, pretty. Netflix has probably made the most money from its investment, but Amazon's yeah. building something a lot bigger. Again, their motivation is to build Prime, right? Right. It's not clear to me how video stuff fits into Amazon's larger strategy because it must drive the prime margins on a per customer basis down significantly because it's free. Well, it would unless it increases and, the number of prime users a lot. Well, Remember, it's, here's the key with prime. Everybody who signs up from prime ends up being a, a, a really good Amazon customer, right? That's the theory. Oh, you're going to, and I notice I'm, I, I only say that because it's true for me. I buy something on Amazon almost every day now. Every day? Almost they every do. day. Right? No, I do too. And that's what are you because, guys buying? Yeah, what are you guys buying? What <laughs> you, toilet paper, paper towels. <laughs> Go to the batteries. bodega. You live no, in yeah, Long they have Island City. Stores in Long Island City. <laughs> I I bought batteries. I have batteries coming today. I needed double A batteries. I told my Echo order double A batteries. That was on Friday. They're coming today, Sunday. Right? Notice. Very interesting. Uh, no, they, it's that's not interesting. I, that, Go to the store. No, that that's it, this is such so, so okay. That's an interesting Hi. point. That where Amazon makes its money is in saving me time. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't that's that. what Prime is. Time cannot, you can't, let me tell you something, young man. You, you could make more money. You could even get better looking, maybe. But you cannot get more time. You've got a certain limited amount of time. Time's the most valuable commodity to you. Is that not right? It didn't Gary, I think Gary Vaynerchuk told me that. I agree, I agree with that. <laughs> Which I, makes I, it true. I don't disagree with it, but I do find that if I don't, walk myself to the store to buy those batteries, I will spend it in front of a screen or a book 99% yeah. of the time. So, and so for me, it gets me it's out not of the good house. Time. Oh, you're like, looking... It's not good time that you're saving. Okay. Well, that, that's the thing. You Alice is totally right there. Life. My partner lives 3,000 miles away from me. I'm bored all the time. <laughs> like, what do you want from me? I like going to Walgreens for batteries and deodorant and toilet paper and wet wipes and, you know, stuff to clean the counter with. It's so good to go. for you, it's just because you're going to get some fresh air and a walk. And support the local economy. The, the people well, who own the, bodega, the bodega near my house is owned by a family. I know every single so person. So it's a political statement for you. It's a statement that I don't think Amazon should be automatically given my entire custom as a, as a consumer. Now, somebody's saying in the chat room, and we'll have to look at the Amazon results, that they made nothing on the sale of physical goods. But see, now this is very deceptive, and I'm sure that you guys will know this. I'm just telling our listeners. Amazon totally controls how much money it makes any given quarter. That's not... I always say Jeff has a dial in his office that he can turn and say, well, I think I'll make $100 million this quarter. <laughs> because basically everything... At, and this is why Amazon's such a success today. From day one... And the investors hated this. They take everything they make and they plow it into infrastructure, right? Uh, if you look at Jeff's uh, letter, they bought more planes. They built more s fulfillment centers. The re they only don't make money on physical goods because they're plowing the profits into this so they can make more money later. Eventually, down the road. Is that right? Yeah. That's, no, yeah. That, that's exactly right. It's the day one main mentality that he always, talk, always talks about. He always says... You don't ever want to be day two in a company. You always want to be the first day. Which sounds exhausting, but pretty smart. Like that, that, right. that just sounds like you never get a lunch break. And you wait till midnight. I'm going to the boat. You don't know anyone see yet. You guys, later. See, I don't. guys, we have a convert on the show right here. Well, I'm, I'm terrified about Amazon because it is obvious. Well, look, first of all, Bezos is brilliant. He's probably, I think, the smartest guy in the, in the bunch. Briefly, the richest man in the world this that was week. That's funny. For one minute. Uh, but he's... Maybe the smartest guy in the budget. I include Zuckerberg and Elon and everybody else. He's, Satya and Satya, you know. everybody else. He, the more you see his strategy unfold, the more you realize he's been thinking this all. I feel like all along, and 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 Ben Thompson is strategy says this. The true goal of Amazon is to get a piece of every financial transaction on the planet. That's a good business if you can get it. Ben Thompson's way smarter than I am, so I'll trust him on that. So uh, how do you do that? Well, you, you, you want more prime customers because that's how you get a piece of their transactions. Whether you make money on it today is not relevant. What you want is you want to own them. Has anybody... Now, here's a question. 
If you were a Prime member, what's the churn rate on Prime? Do people quit? Oh, that's a good question. I I've never heard of anyone low. quitting. But Amazon that's doesn't say, obviously. We don't even no, know they how don't many give Prime, prime members there are. member numbers or anything, but they just say like the average Prime member spends, you know, whatever times more per year than a normal person yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. But that's the only really solid thing we get. We can use ourselves and our friends as a, which is probably not the best no. bellwether, but we can use ours. As yeah, a, well, it's also a one-off cost, right? And it's recurring. You don't necessarily remember, oh, on March 32nd. Right. Or 30, that's not a real date. March 22nd. <laughs> that's when I get billed. Every <laughs> March 32nd, I Prime get that's a $99 date, bill for Prime. Yeah. <laughs> Prime day. But like, you, you, don't, you don't remember it. So, right. you know, it rolls around again. You look at your credit card statement. You're like, damn, I got billed again. And you might complain about it. Maybe you'll ask for a refund. But then maybe you'll remember that the services that might be lost leaders like their video service. You're like, you know, I actually really like that transparent show or something like that. And you know, I really, these batteries are great. Um, and there might be enough little things like that that might not be making the money that Amazon could make, you know, the way I, Netflix is more profitable just on video, but overall it's probably enough to keep people thinking, okay, I'll spend another $99 on this, this, this year. I think especially when you have the, uh, the low cost college subs with like 39 bucks to get you on board and then you leave college you're not going to stop once you've had free shipping for four years it's amazing like it, it is an amazingly good hook right into your wallet uh let's look at the uh the the uh oh that's the 10 q you, you want the q2 i don't want the, the 10 q is i can't I don't, i'm not smart enough to read their 10 q let's look at the uh results here this is their third annual prime day biggest global shopping event ever for amazon even though i think we all know that it it actually isn't a very good deal <clears throat> that Prime Day does not offer particularly good deals. You knew that, right? I don't shop on uh, fake shopping holidays. It's a fake shopping holiday. Yeah. But, they uh, all fake shopping holidays? Yeah. That's why I don't right. shop. Hundreds, Black Friday, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of small businesses and entrepreneurs participate in the global event. 40 million units sold. Biggest event for Amazon devices worldwide. Record sales for Echo, Fire, Tablets, Kindle devices. The Echo Dot, the number one seller. They got it down to 35 bucks, I think. So that's not a surprise. That was a good deal. Yeah, they sold a bunch of TVs. Uh, Amazon has the most, certainly not the biggest uh, box office movie in theaters today, but certainly one of the most best reviewed. The Big Sick, Kumail Johnny and uh, Amy, uh, Emily V. Gordon's uh, wonderful movie, ninety eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes, sixteen Emmy nominations. It's interesting how they run this. This the successes of Amazon Studios is like right up there. In, in the highlights of their earnings. This is important to them. Way before AWS revenue or, you know, international expansion revenue. It, it almost feels unfocused. Is that because this is the sexy? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's the highlight section, right? Right. This also, is, it looks good. It you does. know, that's what investors are going to want to see. It's like, oh, man, not only are they a massively impressive logistics business, they also know how to make a bunch of Emmy-winning shows. I mean, that's insane. Yeah, it is. So to get back to that question, Amazon or Netflix, who's the who's the big winner in uh, in uh, in house production? I think it's got to be Amazon right now, just because I don't know if you all have noticed this, but like you go on Netflix and they're starting to take a strange approach to original content. They might have like seven or eight great shows, you know. The new, everyone wants to see the new season of Stranger Things or something like that, but then they're putting out a lot more, you know, kind of like. They, they seem like completely cynical plays, like a show that's just for like teenage high school drama kids. And then like another one that's just like the same show, but maybe the genders are flipped. And it's it seems like there's a lot more just like trying and seeing, which is like fine. But it does seem like there's a lot more not great content on there now compared to Amazon. Isn't like, that what happened, like though, a, at um, uh, HBO? Like uh, they have big blockbusters and then they have a lot of kind of secondary, not so much watched stuff. I think you have to try a lot of stuff and it's have a hard. lot of failures, right? It's hard to mm. make good, consistently good stuff. I don't blame, I don't think mm. that's a, I don't know if even that's a problem in Netflix. Maybe that's why I think Facebook will never be able to do it. I think it requires taste and Facebook has none. Um, Apple's shown that, it, that they don't have the chops to do No, yeah. and Apple has actual functional You can't taste hire your way to it. Uh, can you? I mean, there must be people They're that trying. are trying. Yeah, you can try. I mean, they have all the well, money in the world. Uh, one uh, note, uh, I'll just throw this in. Uh, this is um, from the information. Remember that uh, AT&T is trying to buy Time Warner. We almost forgot. I did almost forget. Yeah, but that's about to happen because nobody's going to stop it. And as that purchase gets goes through, remember who owns Time Warner, or who Time Warner owns, HBO. 
And remember that AT&T is very unlikely to want to spend money on original production at HBO. Not to mention that they have $120 billion in debt. Wait, AT&T is $120 billion in debt? Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I used <laughs> I to work for Verizon, and, but hell. And they agreed to massive dividends, which they're now regretting. Again, that can kill you. Paying back the shareholders can kill you. If you do it stupidly. <laughs> Well, they have these obligations, uh, and they're going to spend eighty-five billion on Time Warner. So, how much money do they have left? <laughs> like that sounds like they'd be negative. But this may be the time. last Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're not going to see anyway. The interesting article saying, "Will AT and T throttle HBO?" Martin Pierce and Tom Dotan uh, writing. In I love the information. the information. I do too, and I just like to give them a plug. Let's take a break. I, we're not done with uh, financials, but there's a lot more to talk about. DefCon was this week. Lots of security issues. The country of Sweden has now released public information of every one of its citizens. In case you wanted to know, you can find out, and I'll tell you what happened there. Probably the worst government data breach in history. Certainly the most appalling data, data breach in history. Uh, lots more to talk about. Our guests, it's great to have you. Steve Kovac is here from Business Insider. He's a senior correspondent there. Always good. I haven't seen you in a long time. I'm glad to get you back yeah, on. Yeah, it's been a couple months. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad to be back. What are those album covers on the wall? I think I recognize a couple got, of them. Uh, Doobie Brothers, oh, uh, no. Cat Stevens, oh. The Empire Strikes Back uh, record, and Hotel California. Those are um, I've lost all, all my father's old records oh, okay. that he sent me. Okay, um, that's different. They even have his name from when he was on college, so his like, roommate didn't steal it or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's different because that's, that's music I might have listened to, but I, I was hoping for better from you, Steve. <laughs> are you saying Doobie Brothers? It, it's, not dad rock. it's Dad Rock. <laughs> it's Dad Rock. Yeah. And who's a exactly. dad my here? Mm -hmm. yeah. exactly. My dad's around your age. <laughs> yeah, dad, so. uh, he's probably younger than me, no doubt. Uh, also with us, it has, I think it's his first time on uh, The Big Shoe, The Big Round Table. We're really glad to have Mike Murphy here from Quartz. I Thanks love Quartz. Me. Can I just say I love Quartz? That's great to hear. Um, I, I remember when Quartz launched, what a big deal QZ.com was. You're part yeah, it's an awkward website name. Yeah, but I have to say, like saying that over the uh, over Quartz? the phone to sources, it's oh. like, hey, yeah, uh, send me an email at Mike at QZ.com. They're like, what? Huh? Like, it's, <laughs> it's just too the short. letter Q, the too letter short. Z. It's Could you make so it longer? short. Yeah. Like, it's like Quartz when I worked for ZDTV, people thought it was the spaghetti network, ZDTV. Oh, because ZD is in baked they ZD? Yeah, yeah, they yeah, quickly yeah. changed the name to Tech TV because it's like ZD TV. <laughs> what do the ZD stand what, for? Are you a pasta network? What exactly <laughs> What exactly do you cover? Uh, but no, Quartz, I read Quartz uh, religiously. And actually, Quartz is a little bit in the news. We'll talk about that. Oh, really? Well, not Quartz directly. Okay. I feel like I don't, I don't know what you're referencing here. I'm behind. You are obviously behind. Mm. That's uh, Alex behind Wilhelm. Alex Will... Wilhelm, look at your lower third. I like it. Oh my god! Editor in chief. Like, that's that's fast turnaround. That's fast turnaround by the production crew. We had to go out. We had to go uh, get our, uh, our 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 production guy. He was uh, was at uh, down at the amusement park at Six Flags. He was on a break with his family. We got him in. He crafted that third lower third just for you moments ago, and he sh and he's pissed at me. And so. that's why Twit will never go off the air. That's right. It's the attention to detail. Attention to detail. Thank you very much. Our show. Our show, Alex, is at uh, Crunchbase News, the new Crunchbase News. Thank you. Yeah. Can anybody go there, or do you have to pay money? Uh, anyone can. Crunchbase dot news. Dot. There you go. Crunchbase dot news. Vanity URLs, homie. I like it. Yeah. And uh, I like your use of pseudo Simpson uh, graphics as well. That's, uh, that's our lead designer, Leanne. She does all of our stuff for us. Okay. It's not the it's not the design. It's the color. Uh, it's color Simpsons color. Do choices. you like the colors? I, I, like I the really palette. I really like them. I like the palette. Ooh, she does gifts to us too. Yeah, isn't that love great? that. Love that bicycle. Yeah, isn't she's that good? fantastic. And and it ties into the headline with profit taking a backseat to growth. Investors fuel bike sharing hype in yep. China. That's my new intern, Grace. She's fantastic. Grace Goo. Yeah. Good job, Grace. She's way smarter than I am too. Grace, can you get on that Alex Will Wilhelm uh, <laughs> graphic though? Don't encourage my team to harass yeah, me more you, than they are. You gotta do. you gotta fix that. It's uh, <laughs> it's time. Time for an ad, Leo. Our show <laughs> show day brought to you. I liked. You know what? You started it. Uh, you used to enough. come in here, you'd rib me, I'd be nice to you. So now... <laughs> Is that what happened? The gloves are off, Wilhelm. The gloves are off. Our show today brought you... No, it means I like you. I know. It's I know. like it's like I'm like Scaramucci. And You're like... Uh, does that make me Sean Spicer? Sean Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> as long as I'm not just, your Ryan's Priebus, I'm good. It just means I like you. Uh... <laughs> 
Our show today brought to you by Hover.com. I love Hover. Love the Hover. When you're going to get a new domain name, don't go to the place where they sell 15 other things. It's like going to the bodega to buy a .com. Don't do that. You want to go somewhere where they specialize in domain names. Domain names are what they do. They're not all about upselling you to some other product. Hover is very simple. They sell domain names and email, and that's it. But they've got them all. 400 domain extensions. You got the .com. You got the .net. You got great extensions like design, .design, .tech, .pizza. Alex, willwilhelm.pizza. It'd be great. Not ninja. Wilhelm.ninja. Dot horse. Once you find your domain, you can use Hover Connect, and it's it couldn't be easier. Look at all the services they support. So when you want to move your uh, or use your domain name, it's trivially easy. You just press a button, and they'll set it all up for you. Your domain works with whatever email programs you're using. I think one of the things people should absolutely do uh, we had a house painter come in to give us an estimate the other day, and his email address was at Comcast.net. And I thought, no, you know, if you're a business, first thing you do, you go to Hover.com, and for 10 bucks, you get a domain name. You know, your business.com or .net or, or, you know, .ninja, whatever. But get that custom domain name and then have Hover do your email. They can either host it or have it re... As I, what I do is I have it go over to Gmail. That's very inexpensive. And that way you look more professional. People say, oh, do I have to have a website? You don't. I mean, but it's easy to do. And But again, Hover isn't going to upsell you on that. They don't do websites. When you want to buy a domain name, when you want to buy an email address, you shouldn't have to opt out of page after page of add-ons you don't want or need. You, By the way, who is privacy? Those other guys upsell you? It comes with every domain. Every domain are registered. Well, if they can't. Some of them can't support it. But all the supported domains, which is most of them, you get who is privacy. You want it. Trust me. Uh, with volume discounts, the more domains you have in your account, the more of a discount you'll, that'll apply. So it kind of encourages you. I think I have several hundred now. To several hundred total? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Leo. Oh, you have more. I have like five. What? Yeah. Oh, you're just not. You're a slacker. Instead of going to the bodega, register some domain names. With Hover, no problem. No digging through help articles to figure it out. You don't have to read the FAQ. You call them. They're famous for their phone support. Or you can email help at hover.com. But the phone support's awesome. There's no phone tree. They're not going to put you on hold. They're just going to help you. I love it. No trans. I have to transfer you. Another. No, they will do it. They have the best support in the business. Find a domain name for your idea and go to hover.com slash twit. You'll even get 10% off your first purchase. Hover.com slash twit. Really love it. All my domain names. I've... You know, it takes takes sometimes some of these registrars, not hover, but some of these other registrars, are loath to let go of your domain name. They For example, slowslatty.com, yeah, slow perhaps. Slowslatty. The minute you change the domain, they start to change it. They go, "Oh, we've locked that for six months. Sorry." Call us. <laughs> Call us. I finally got it transferred over to Hover. It was driving me crazy. It was Leo Laporte. I finally got it over to transfer uh, to Hover. Everything's at Hover. It's the best. And we thank them for their support. Hover.com/slash twit. Okay. Who uses dot ninja, by the way? Just before we leave this entire like Comcast dot ninja, like I am not a dot ninja. Like what what do you use it for? Anything you want. All right. Why how what's the question? That's it just obvious. annoys me. I don't know. I, the rock dot ninja. Uh but he's not a ninja. He's just a slabular human. You know, if you were a ninja, would you admit you were a ninja? I would brag about it nonstop. <laughs> you you would never hear the end of it. I would just ramble. All right. Uh, anything else to say about Amazon's earnings? AWS was big. Oh, yeah, we didn't get to AWS. By the way, we should mention Amazon Web Service is a sponsor of some of our shows. Oh, can we still talk um, about it? Yes, of course. Uh, oh, no, absolutely. But I just want people to, you know, I'd like to disclaim that kind of stuff so good. they understand. Uh, I'm not going to say nice things about them just because. Amazon Books, Amazon Books opened actual bookstores in Linfield, Mass, Paramus, New Jersey, and Manhattan. They have eight bookstores and five more coming. What the hell are they doing? There's, What is the deal there? What's that all about? Why would Amazon be opening bookstores? The big F you to Borders and Barnes and Noble. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we put you out of business. Now we're going to take over. Right. I, I think They're the only the, thing that, uh, might be, uh, uh. that might be interesting, and it kind of ties in with the purchase of uh, Whole Foods, is that if you're good, so this is Bezos. I feel like he's thinking 20 moves ahead. If you're going to have everything go online, you take a, a cut of all transactions, what happens to downtown? What does shopping mean? There's still part of us wants to go shop. You want to go to the bodega. You want to go to a bookstore and browse. So 
and I, I can't claim credit for this. This is not a novel idea, but what? But I want to float it past you guys. I think he's starting to think of shopping as an experience as opposed to a purchase. And people will still want this experience. They'll want to go somewhere. They'll want to get out of the house. They'll want to look at stuff before they buy it. But they'll still buy it at Amazon. And so I think he's using these as experiments. And, and Whole Foods yeah, will and become the, like that, right? The grocery store thing is really interesting, too. I mean, grocery stores, the experience still kind of stinks, right, and hasn't changed in decades. You go to a supermarket today in 2017, it's pretty much the same as it was in, you know, 1967. And, and you have to think that, that Jeff looks at it and says, how inefficient, right? Right. And so, you know, this cashier-free store idea, yeah. that's one thing, the idea that you just can walk in, grab all the stuff you want, and leave on your own without even having to interact with a human. That's kind of cool and interesting, and uh, don't have to wait in line, and then the person who checks you out is miserable with their job, and, you know, they don't want to talk to you or whatever. Um, it, it, that's interesting. That's that's an interesting play if they could do something and change the grocery store experience. Delivery delivered groceries still kind of stinks. As if anyone who's used Instacart or Fresh Direct or even Amazon Fresh getting produce and you want to see the food you're about to buy in a lot of cases. Yes. And uh, so there's room uh, for them to experiment there for sure. I but it's kind of weird. Go ahead. Like the the difference between what Amazon go their their grocery store test is and these bookstores they're almost antithetical because the grocery stores are doing exactly that like oh we're going to get rid of the friction and have this very creepy personless grocery experience but then the bookstores are supposed to be these like very experiential like come look at our stuff maybe buy it here maybe buy it on Amazon you know like a like a show floor sort of thing which is like the exact opposite so it's weird that they're um, trying both of these at the same times for for different, uh, you know, industries, essentially. But why, I have to think, why did Amazon buy Whole Foods? And I think partly they think we can do better. But I also think Whole Foods already had some of this vision. The Whole Foods in Austin has a coffee shop, has oh, it's sit-down restaurant. Right? You've been there? I haven't been there. Yeah, I've only been heard there. about it. Tell me it's about it. My yeah, my sister used to live right across the street from there, and we would go whenever I visit her. And it's yeah, you can sit down; they can cook. It's not a, meal a grocery for you. store, right? No, you you can I mean, you can get a glass of you can get a glass of wine and walk at the wine bar and walk around and drink wine or beer or whatever while you shop. What? Uh, yeah, see, that's it, why that's it, what I'm it, saying. It, that's what Bezos is interested in: experience, not shopping. Ambulatory uh, boozing. <laughs> right. AKA. Who doesn't want to get drunk and shop and then you spend more because you're lit. So it's perfect. Uh, I, I, th I really think that that one of the reasons Whole Foods was of interest to him. Of course, there's a lot of other reasons, including all their locations. But I feel like there's that this is that Jeff's trying to understand what shopping is going to look like in 20 years. I have, an, I have an idea that I want to flip past you. What if he was watching companies try to reinvent the grocery world through Instacart and Blue Apron and realized that without having a physical presence that he could leverage to make uh, Amazon Fresh more competitive in the long term, they were eventually not going to be able to take over the grocery business with their strategy as the market changed underneath them. So they bought this asset that had Instacart and uh, Blue Apron tie-ins in a sense. Well, definitely well, you Instacart got, side. I, you got to think that you Blue Apron's them. praying that Amazon buys them because otherwise... Oh, Amazon won't. By the way, Blue Apron, another sponsor. I love the idea of Blue Apron. But Amazon's already offering in certain locations packaged meals exactly. very similar to Blue Apron. The Blue Apron stock tanked uh, last week. It really was hurt by this. But Amazon can never do Blue Apron on its own. But if it buys Whole Foods, I feel like it has a much better uh, way into your kitchen. And also Instacart much better is not chain. Whole Foods, though. I know. Oh, did I flip Amazon this Fresh right. is Whole Foods. Is, is Leo Whole Smart. There you go. Inst so they didn't buy Instacart. Instacart, another company that, that, that didn't do so well in the markets as, as a result of Amazon's purchase or pending purchase of Whole Foods. So I, I feel like Amazon, I don't know, I just, I, I'm trying to read the the, the court's crystal, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, I, uh, I feel like there's there's a long, I always think there's a long-term strategy that's not immediately obvious when Bezos does stuff. That's just something. Well, this, it also gives you credibility, right? I mean, everybody essentially likes Whole Foods. Um, you know, they're respected for their quality versus like, you know, the way you think of them versus Kroger's or any other supermarket, right? Um, so that helps if you are, as Alex is saying, you know, trying to move into these new fields. Like I don't want an Amazon box of food, but I would want a Whole right. Foods box of food. Very good point. It's a, it's a, it's a brand. They bought the brand. And this is a big issue for them in general. You know, they are quickly becoming the largest fashion retailer in the world. And yet 
nobody necessarily wants to buy Amazon clothes. You know, they're, they're launching brands specifically just for this, but they're not called in the same way they have Amazon basics for, you know, batteries or, or whatever. You're not buying Amazon basics clothes because people have some desire for, for branding. They have some desire for like some perceived level of quality. I bought a shirt yesterday off Amazon for $12 from this company called good threads, which is as far yes. as I can tell, like one of their fake companies. Right. Um, but it was like $12 and it felt more real for some reason than like if it had been Amazon fashion, like was the name of the brand. Like there's some utilitarian aspect of that brand. That's great for certain things. Doesn't but Amazon own good reads as well? It does. So they good do, threads yeah. is a play on good reads. I would guess <laughs> expect more Probably, good yeah. things from Amazon. Uh, well, we have two Alexa businesses, which is very confusing as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Chris Sager's writing in slate. Amazon is now the most interesting and important problem in American antitrust law. Uh, I don't, I think if I'm Jeff Bezos, I'm thinking briefly, at least for the next four years, there is a, a huge opportunity to become a trust, <laughs> to become a monopoly, because I doubt there'll be any antitrust prosecutions under the Trump administration. I don't this know, is, Trump, does not, Trump they, I, I disagree with that. Trump uh, really likes to needle Bezos, and there's a good populist message. He hates Bezos because of the Washington them. Post. He's confused about... And, well, and also the taxing, which he's not obviously educated on, but he gets on him about taxes. And then Steve Mnuchin said something this week about Amazon taxes. So they're clearly looking at them. And that he that's could, the base. He, he's talking to the yeah, base for that. The base doesn't who, want when, any. When doesn't he talk to the base? But I know. But my point is <laughs> that's red meat for the base, but the base doesn't know from antitrust action. The base no, doesn't know that Amazon. Not. Although didn't in the on the campaign trail, uh, he did say, I'm not going to allow ATT Time Warner to go ahead. Yeah, and that yet, was true. And yet it's absolutely going ahead. Uh, will there be uh, any, any, I mean, I think Congress might say we should investigate Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods. Will, will, will are people, I guess that's a question. Is the government starting to worry about Amazon and its size? Because I think what's, what's absolutely happening is uh, Amazon is, is making a very strong move to do exactly that, to basically become the place you buy everything. And, and do we as consumers, I like it that you go down to the bodega, Alex, because I buy everything from Amazon and I, I've already given in to them, my new overlords. I think. Yeah, I think uh, Corey ahead, Booker, yeah. Senator from New Jersey, he um, was on the Recode podcast a few days ago and he actually addressed this very question and he brought up Amazon, the Amazon Whole Foods deal as an example. And so members of Congress very, are definitely thinking about this and not that they can really take any action on it right now or going to take any action, but it is something on their minds, at least on the Democrat side. What but it's, it's not as clear as it's been for, you know, past antitrust cases, right? Like you break up um, the bells because they're all they are controlling the telephone. We're not at a state yet where you can say that Amazon controls shopping. It might get to that, which is a very scary possibility. But, you know, I, as with Alex, I still go to the bodega. Um, I still buy batteries from other places when I need them. And so what are you saying that they're a monopoly on all of our dollars? Not necessarily yet. It's not like Google in Europe where they are the only search engine or something right. like that. There's nothing that they are the only thing of yet. They might be everything eventually, which is scary, but I don't know what the case is that you would actually bring right now. I guess you can't. And yet, uh, what my fear is it'll happen in a very, it'll happen so quickly that there'll be nothing you could do about it at that point. Until you can prove that consumer prices will be harmed by going up due to an Amazon monopoly, I don't see how you That's actually... That's how it works in the U.S. The U.S. Yes. antitrust laws to protect consumers. Right. In Europe, antitrust laws to protect companies, and competition. Right. Oh, I was looking at this only from a U.S. perspective. I mean, I don't know well, if the European Well, in fact, that's one thing that all. slows Amazon down is they don't have a very good international presence. And yeah. there are very big players like Alibaba in China that are, the in effect, the Amazon of Asia or the Amazon of... Europe well, and we're also seeing, I think it was Bannon in the White House discuss um, Google and Facebook also as monopolies of a certain sort, that they're kind of required uh, tools to use on the internet and therefore they should be regulated in some capacity, which I'm sure will excite a lot of people. But I don't know how you possibly put into place antitrust regulations against a, a web service like like a, like, a, like a search engine. I don't know how that works. Yeah. Um, and so to me, I think a lot of this is just talk. 
and people haven't thought about how you would actually deprecate Amazon or break it up into smaller pieces. Because I think it's kind of one other piece, right? It's, it's right. one vertically integrated stack. And so you, just like you couldn't take Microsoft apart 15 years ago, I don't think you can take these companies apart now. Now, I do agree that concentration of power is, is a risk in a market-based economy, but I, I don't, I, I've yet to see any good ideas about how you could actually approach that. And I don't think anyone has done the work uh, required to actually come up with those plans. Not that they'd be any good, but they haven't even gotten that far, which is, I think, kind of embarrassing to the idea. Amazon Web Services, which is the secret weapon of Amazon, powered really most of the revenue growth uh, for Amazon. Its revenue rose 42% to $4.1 billion. Uh, anything to say about that? I mean, everybody from Microsoft to Apple uh, to Google going after Amazon Web Services, but they are the powerhouse, aren't they? The I saw a very snarky tweet about that from IBM <laughs> saying that they they actually uh, had a slightly higher revenue than Amazon Web Services this past quarter, which was like, oh, yeah, it's very nice for you. Nice for you, IBM. <laughs> well, as long as we're talking IBM, let's talk about Sweden. What you may ask is the connection. I was curious if that was a segue I, or a jump. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Swedish uh, Transport Agency in 2015 outsourced its IT to IBM Sweden, ignoring warnings from the Swedish Security Service, <laughs> and in fact breaking rules in place to protect the security of this database. IBM put the data unencrypted on servers in Romania and the Czech Republic. What data? Well, everything. Turns out the uh, Swedish transport agency has information on every driver's license, every vehicle, every road, every bridge. But even more than that, and this is something I want to, there's a New York Times article about it. Uh, there's this article in uh, the Hacker News. The, the, even more than this, the issue is uh, what exactly, we know this data is now like <laughs> public it's record. But what, what we're curious is what is, what is this data include apparently even things like the names of people working undercover for a uh, special intelligence unit of the Swedish Armed Forces, the, sweet, the names of people working for SAPO, the Swedish Security Service, people in the Witness Protection Program, everything, uh, birthdays, addresses, pictures, all of it was sent in clear text to the Czech Republic where... At least three unauthorized people had full access to it. But worse, <laughs> some of this data was emailed, publicly emailed, clear text. And then when they found out, oh, whoops, there was some secret stuff in there, they sent another email saying, here's all the secret stuff. Could you uh, delete that? <laughs> <laughs> Is this like a joke? Is this, they had no address encryption, no in-transit encryption. No, they had clear text all. early enough. If only IBM had a tool that was AI, they put a bunch of marketing behind to convince us how smart they were. It's unclear how much of this data, you know, leaked out, but there's no way to know because it wasn't protected in any way. It could easily have been copied and, you know, it could be on somebody's USB key somewhere and there's no record. So there's no way uh, of knowing it. Uh, Maria Agren, who is the uh, director general of the Sweden, Swedish Transport Agency, did lose her job over this. She was fired in January and fined two weeks of uh, salary. Wow, that's quite so, strict. <laughs> so she really, I mean, she paid the price, $8,500. Uh, um, Wait, she gets paid $8,500 every two weeks? Yeah, it's not a high-paying job. <laughs> it's a $17,000 a month job. Do the math. I can do the math. It's about a quarter million a year. It's more than I make. Yeah. But she was in charge of the entire Swedish transport. I can agency. still be jealous. <laughs> I can be as petty as I want. She also sidestepped security privacy laws. Uh, she kind of didn't do it right. Obviously, they wanted to save money, and the budget was tight. Um, millions Why did they of pay so much. Yeah, millions of personal records and data about the infrastructure of the country's defense. Anyone with a driver's license, anyone who pays tolls in Stockholm, pilots, train conductors, air traffic controllers, armored vehicles, <laughs> bridges and tunnels, and their, you know, weak points, all of this. It's got to be terrifying. Uh, it's like a how-to guide for terrorists. Yeah. <laughs> I, again, 
maybe nobody knew and it's been sitting there for a couple of years but maybe nobody made a copy and so but we'll know because you'll see it floating around on the dark net at some point oh for if, sure. if it got out also how embarrassing for ibm right yeah <laughs> i mean the old joke was that no one ever got fired for buying ibm yeah. well we now they have were, a direct case it, proving that's they, it, they were paid a hundred million dollars in this outsourcing $100 million. Jeez. Yeah, but they didn't really we'll put your anything. servers in romania yeah. it'll be great yeah i that's it just, wasn't even really IBM. It was, it was, you know, subsidiaries in Romania and the Czech Republic. Are you making it worse? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, okay. I don't, I, you know, I just, it's, it is now considered to be the worst uh, breach of uh, government, breach of data in history. All right. Actually, can, we, can I say one more thing about uh, Amazon before we move on? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the AWS operating income was $916 million in the last quarter, and Amazon's total operating income for North America was $436 million. And then their net loss in the international was, on an operating basis, was seven twenty four. So essentially, AWS made a bulk of their operating profits around the world and subsidized their international losses. So that's how important AWS is to the Amazon engine. Not bad. It's not off course. It's actually incredibly It's kind of funny because it was an afterthought product. Absolutely. It was just some engineer said, you know, we could do this. We could well, sell it too. That's actually where you have to say Jeff maybe didn't have all the chess pieces in mind. He was just lucky a little bit. Yeah, you know. Hey, lucky is as, as, as good as anything. It's, it's better I'll than most things, I'll actually. Take, I'll take luck. Um, Apple's have paid a couple of uh, big fines. Uh, they just paid uh, the uh, University of Wisconsin $506 million. Uh, this is a long-standing patent lawsuit against University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, a uh, district judge ruled on Monday Apple has to pay that half a billion dollars for infringing on a microprocessor technology IP. Um, adding, by the way, to an, a previous $234 million decision two years ago. And we've just learned from Nokia's uh, quarterly results that um, Apple paid Nokia $1.7 billion. I'm sorry, euros. That's even more. It's almost $2 billion uh, for uh, patents. It's almost like Apple should stop stealing stuff from other people. <laughs> I mean, apparently it's not very lucrative. They're, they're fighting against Qualcomm still, though. Yes, they that, are. That one's going to go on for a while. Like, Qualcomm has stopped paying Apple. Apple has stopped paying Qualcomm. So, no. And then also Alphabet paid a large EU fine this quarter. So really, it seems like some of the big five are trying to shell out instead of just receiving. Well, but Alphabet made $26 billion this quarter. In so revenue. In revenue. Revenue. Uh, their their profits though uh, were significantly more than uh, than the fine, right? I mean, I'm trying to find the profits. Like, here. Net income is 3.5 billion, including that the includes the including the, the 2.7 billion dollar fine. Yeah. So even after paying the 2.7 billion dollar fine, they made three and a half billion. And so they made a big point of saying that in their actual earnings release, they had a box at the top saying. By the way, if we didn't have to pay right. this big old fee, this is how much we actually would yeah. have made. Six point two billion, almost more than two billion dollars a month. That's crazy revenue for Alphabet. That, I mean, income like profit. Yeah. yeah, for Alphabet, their cash position ninety ninety four billion. It's not Apple money, but hey, I, I mean, I'll take it. That's <laughs> fine. Probably mostly in the U.S., which is nice. But they didn't they fall uh, Kovac after hours when they dropped this. Wasn't there some disappointment? They did. Yeah, and so a lot of that was due to TAC or the tuition. Oh, tuition. <laughs> That's an amazing. Did they get a tuition credit for their college yeah. tuition? I hope so. Traffic, traffic acquisition costs are oh. going up, and they're going to continue going up, and that is really squeezing their margins, and um, that's what spooked investors after hours that day. So tell us about traffic acquisition costs. That's what they pay mobile operators. Alex, correct me if I'm wrong. If I say this wrong, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. But basically, that's what they pay like mobile operators and carriers. Um, and so as mobile searches increase, TAC goes up. And of course, mobile is only is, going to increase. Is that also the money like Mozilla gets if you yes. use the Google search box or Safari gets because Google searches are built into Safari? They pay money to Apple yeah. and pay money to Mozilla. In fact, that's what keeps Mozilla and Firefox afloat probably. Oh, for sure. For a long time. For a long time. Um, exactly. So that's interesting. You pay money, traffic acquisition costs. Okay. Yeah. Have you and ever so covered, it, sorry, Steve, go for it. No, no, I'm just saying it's like, it's just, uh, it's just an increasingly large expense for them right. and- um, they, they and they they're honest about. It. They keep warning. This is why it's happening. The rise of programmatic ads and the two things: rise of programmatic and um, increased mobile searches. Ad business up sixteen percent. 
but that's a slowdown from the 20% growth uh, a year ago. So it's still growing, but it's not growing as fast as it did. In percentage terms, it could be growing the same speed in uh, raw dollar okay. terms, but this underscores why Alphabet's paying so much money right now in terms of losses or expenses on its other bets, because Kovac is completely correct. This deceleration will persist, and if they want to maintain to their revenue another, multiple, they need to have that next revenue source. Next business, including Waymo, which is self-driving cars, Nest, mm -hmm. which is uh, the thermostats and the cameras and other IoT devices. I presume all the IoT stuff will yes. end up in Nest, except Google Home, oddly. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Verily, what is Verily? That's their health Verily. tech thing, right? Life sciences. Life sciences. They do the contacts that like track your glucose or something. But do they the uh, the utensils for people with tremors? They make those. Oh, so they actually have products. Yeah, yeah. You can buy the the utensils now. I think they sell them on, believe it or not, Amazon. Oh. Uh, and um, another thing you might want to look at within Google, their hardware division and cloud business is growing nicely. I mean, it's still tiny compared to the ad business, but they like to point to uh, cloud and hardware, and that includes like the Pixel phone, of course, and things like that, and um, as uh, something that's just continues to grow and they're betting big on. And then YouTube, of course, they really think there is a lot of uh, room to grow advertising revenue out of YouTube. Uh, YouTube has to be both a huge drain on money and uh, and at the same time uh, it's it's revenue yeah but they but they God what they must spend and servers and storage and bandwidth you're right yeah Is that I it? wish I knew I wish I I wish they would break it out <laughs> yeah they it looked like it was gonna be this time that they were gonna break it out but no it's still a, a mystery. And you have to think the reason they don't break it out is they don't want people to know what a drain YouTube must be, right? Mm. I it's mean, they be, spent but they one keep point, talking about it. Yeah, but they spent yeah. $1.65 billion on Hunter Walk, what, like a decade ago now, a decade and two, whatever it was, and it still loses money. But, I mean, they can't give it up. I What's mean, Hunter Walk? Oh, Hunter Walk is a VC who used to work at YouTube. It was a oh, joke okay. for Steve. Sorry. I'm sorry. I, you guys are having I got it. I got financial it. humor going on. I mean, there's like 10 people in all of Silicon Valley. We kind of all know them, so... <laughs> So here's Alphabet's other bets. Uh, Google Ventures, which is, of course, their venture arm. Uh, Verily, Google Fiber. That's kind of gone, right? That's yep. dead. Yeah. Nest. Calico. That's that's the uh, that's a long bet. That's researching uh, why people uh, age and die. Yeah, that's that's they want to cure death. Cure death. <laughs> with Calico. You know, yeah. it's one of those high risk, high reward kind of investments. Right. right. It's a binary result, I feel. <laughs> you succeed. You're golden. <laughs> For, forever <laughs> forever to be uh, fair a lot of those bets are that way i mean not all as facetiously as that one but like if they figure out self-driving cars before anyone else that's what they're going to be known for in a hundred years yeah and it's the same with you know verily or calico or any of this stuff if they're the ones who can figure out like these massive changes that's what they're going to be known for they're not going to be known as a search bar company or you know a company that made a okay phone once but other bets are still a tiny fraction of the over seven percent of overall revenue, and and I don't know, you know, if that you know that's the, how meaningful that is given the costs and so forth. And so, I forget what that what other bets lost, but you got to also keep in mind that some of the other bets, especially X, um, for example, are designed to lose money. X for X right. and Jigsaw will never make money. Right. Period. They're 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 uh, goals are to make the next big thing. Well, and to, you know years on the road have something that spins out and becomes a Waymo yeah. or something. It's kind of like uh, the lab. It's a lab. It's kind of like uh, yeah. Bell Labs or uh, yeah. you know uh, SRI or uh, so they, they in fact it. Waymo came out ultimately came out of X. It was originally an X project that they And spun they just out. spun out another one called Dandelion which is um, They got to get yeah. better names. This is ridiculous. Now this now Dandelion Calico. is going to be not it's not going to be an Alphabet company. It's going to be its own individual oh. company outside of Alphabet, but they spun it out of X and what they're doing is making affordable geothermal uh, heating and cooling Ooh, for houses. I love that. That's cool. And usually, I, I've never really looked into it until this happened, but apparently it's a very expensive process, and they kind of, they claim, crack the code to make it uh, more affordable to install. But it's only good where there's geothermal activity, right? What, how good? Yeah, I think they're starting in New York State at first, and they might go on from there. Up at the Saratoga Springs. Mm. Wherever yeah, there are uh, spas, there'll be geothermal heat. Yeah, it's like all of Iceland. Iceland? Iceland. Yeah. It's great. Uh, the, up the, here, uh, we have the Blue Lagoon. Yeah. 
We have a Calistoga over here. We got geothermal. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can use that to power the city. Who knows? Yeah. How close do you have to be to the uh, hot springs to? The get plants are usually right next to them. Like literally the one of the Blue Lagoon is across the street. So like one side of it is industrial park and one side of it is beautiful spa. I think you'd maybe invest in something a little more like global, like wind or something. I don't know. Solar's doing great. Solar's doing really well. They have a solar arm, right? They have yeah. that. They have something in solar and, and wind and as well. They have wind. Specs. Yeah. Oh. I got wind, but that's another story for another day. Let's <laughs> uh, let's take a break. We, <laughs> we're talking. There is so much to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. So much to talk about. I guess if you drilled a hole deep enough, you could take advantage of the difference in temperature between the Earth's core and the Earth's surface. We tried that in Russia once. We Seems as risky. Far as we could. It melts. Your drill bit melts eventually. Seems risky. Yeah. Like you're going to let, you know, Godzilla's going to, something bad is going to come out of the hole. Or a volcano. <laughs> drill down or, and all you find yeah, is Trump might tweets. Erupt. <laughs> uh, our show today brought to you with great panel, by the way. It's have, I'm having a great time. Steve Kovac is here from Business Insider from Quartz. It's uh, Mr. Murphy. First time. How do you feel? Is it okay? Is it going well? Pretty great. Yeah, yeah. over here in Brooklyn. Mike Murphy in Brooklyn. <laughs> Steve Kovac in Queens. And uh, the man without a country, Alex Wilhelm. True. He is uh, He's a bi-coastal. I, I now am bi-coastal, yes. There's a rumor floating Oh, you around. are? Yeah, I, uh, I, I can say it, right? Yeah, I live in... Uh, I live in Leo's old house, ironically, in Providence part of the time now. I grew up, the house I grew up in when I, I moved out of when I was like 15, he's living in my house. No way. My, yeah. my girlfriend owns it. He's so. living in my mom and dad's bedroom. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty Talk funny. Talk about confusing. I just got back a week ago. I'm so confused. <laughs> It's a great place. How did you guys figure out? How did you figure out it was his house? How did you make this connection? We, so his girlfriend was visiting and uh, she mentioned that she grew up in Providence. Right. And I said, oh, I grew up in Providence, Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, she said, oh, where? And it didn't take, it took us about 30 seconds to figure out she was, she owned my old house. It was, oh I live God, on Street X. Funny. Oh my gosh, me too. I grew up in X She number. said, what house on Street X? And I said, there's 21. And she said, that's my house. Yeah. Wow. I took pictures for you. <laughs> that's, by Small the way, world. that's when I knew we're in a simulation. That proved it. <laughs> that's the glitch in the matrix. I now know. Right. It's a simulation. Does that happen to you guys? It happens to you every once in a while. You know, oh, simulation. Not, nothing on that scale. That's pretty amazing. That's a glitch in the simulation. If, yeah. if this is a simulation, I want to re-roll my character with better hair. Too late. Okay. <laughs> Part of the, Well, you got to understand the rules of the simulation. The whole idea is that you have, you're, this is it. You rolled the character. You got to go from birth to death. This is it. There's no fixing. Do I get to try it again? Yeah, next time. You can roll a different character. But All right. you've decided to do a chaotic mage. And that's it. You're, you you got to you got to live with that. I don't even know if that's offensive or a compliment. I just I'll just take it. Let's do it. The simulation is saving ram. It's right untoward. They didn't have enough ram to have more houses. It and they thought, well, what is the chance of a collision? Oh my god, we had a collision. There's somebody there's some operator, some system and going, "Oh, crap." I got to rewrite that code. Why did I give IBM this contract? Yeah. You should have put more RAM in the damn thing. Our show today, see, if they'd used a Drobo, this wouldn't be a problem. Good segue. Our show today brought to you by the best way to store your stuff. Drobo is a family of expandable, massive, safe, simple-to-use storage arrays. It's all of that. Safe because, well, it was started by a guy who had a hard drive crash. He, th he said, I have a RAID array. I'm safe. And his data died, and, it's, and, the, and then the RAID didn't work. And he said, this RAID sucks. So he invented something better. They call it Beyond RAID, and it is awesome. It's got all the features of a redundant storage array, but better. Take a look at the amazing Drobo devices. I have multiple Drobos. I use a Drobo Mini as my data drive for my iMac at home. I have a Drobo 5N, and now the new Drobo 5D3. Oh, you got to take a look at that. That thing is a beast. Look at the 5D3. Inside, you've got lightning fast Thunderbolt 3, so you're able to, you know, what is it, 40 gigabits a second? I mean, it's amazing throughput. Dual Thunderbolt 3 ports, so you can daisy chain it. You don't give up your port. A USB 3 Type-C port just for fun, just for giggles. The Drobo 5D3 has performance twice as fast as the previous generation. It's their third generation five bay direct attach solution. So not only is it fast, they put a faster processor in here. And one thing I love about the Drobos, all of them have this little 
port in the bottom that you can put a little NVMe card in, a little flash drive in. I do this in all my Drobos, and that really speeds up small file reads and writes. It's a little cache. Plus, the Drobos set up in such a way that even if the power goes out, you will never lose any data. It's got a little battery in there. It will finish every write and then safely shut down. You can use a 5D3 to safely edit, store, and photos, videos. If you're doing 5 or 4K workflow, it's fast enough, it's big enough. Back up all your data and then some. And their fully automated Beyond RAID technology provides simplicity, expandability, and data protection. Right now, look at this. You get the little... You get the little sticker on the front when you buy it, a free Drobo skin while supplies last. Go to drobostore.com. Check out their complete line of products. They've recently lowered prices on almost the entire line, but we're going to do even more. We're going to save you an extra 10% on the purchase of select Drobo models, including this new 5D3. This, if you're a photographer or videographer, why don't you have this yet? Go to drobostore.com. Our discount code is TWIT10. TWIT10. And you'll get 10% off and a free Drobo skin. I love how it looks on the 5D3. That's pretty. I can go on and I can sing. It's, I, I am all in on Drobo. The lights on the front that tell you all is well. They tell you if a drive is, is you know, the smallest drive is running low on capacity. You just swap in a bigger drive. You can mix, mix and match drives. These lights all tell you something, and that's awesome. Plus, it's just a, mag, a magnet. You just you pull the front off, and it's really easy to pop in the drives. Toolless uh, drives. It's, I can go on and on. Get yourself a Drobo. Get thee to the Drobo store. And then don't forget to use the offer code TWIT10 to save 10% off select models. Drobostore.com. We had a great week this week on TWIT. Lots to talk about, but I thought instead of talking about it, I'd show you. Watch. Previously on TWIT. Lego is releasing a new kit that's going to help kids to learn how to program their own projects in creative ways. These, these are traditional Lego bricks. What the app has is a version of Scratch. That if you move these little blocks of code together, things will happen. And kids figure this out really quickly. Can you program it to pick up all the Lego that uh, are all over your floor? 2.0. It's going to have to be <laughs> like a <boost. laughs> iOS today. You're in a restaurant, yep. you're kind of thinking like, I want to see my food before it comes to the table. You want to see the food at Tavern 62? Yeah. <gasps> Look at oh. that. Oh, and this is exactly the kind of food I can eat on a fast. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So Matt Break Weekly. Yes, The Rock did make a movie with Siri. Hey Siri, you're the best. Thanks, Mr. Big, Bald <laughs> and Beautiful. Call me Mr. Big, Bald and Beautiful. Oh, I got bold. I like being bold and beautiful. Siri, nice choice. Twit, why didn't I get your mass text? I'm in your contacts. They really put the extra effort into this here. So you've got the, the pit stains, you've got the Darth <laughs> Vader helmet, the scissor lift to nowhere. Can, can I say that's Rock. one of my favorite kinds of like shots when they have to rent super expensive camera and lighting equipment just to put on a set. <laughs> and never use it. I forgot that... I forgot that I had Siri call me Mr. Big, Bold, and Beautiful. <laughs> it was a little embarrassing the other day when it, she responded to me that way. You played it off pretty well, though. You looked confident <laughs> in the moment. Yeah. Oops. Uh, oh, we got a big week coming up. There's lots of news ahead. And, of course, we'll have it all on TNT. Jason Howell, what, you, what, what will you be watching? What's on your schedule? This week on Tuesday, August 1st, Bitcoin could see a big fork that would result in something called Bitcoin Cash. This would be the result of many issues Bitcoin has had scaling over the past few years as transactions uh, that should take minutes end up taking days or weeks to process. We'll find out on Tuesday. On Wednesday, August 2nd, Amazon is set to host its first job fair in almost a dozen factory locations across the U.S. as it scales up its workforce to the tune of 50,000 new jobs jobs. Many of those will be filled on site as the company staffs up in preparation for the holidays and, uh, you know, its other headline catching efforts. And on Thursday, August 3rd, Altspace VR will be closing its virtual doors, which some say is a harbinger of things to come for other VR outfits as a general excitement around VR continues to cool. Altspace VR launched in 2013 and supported many of the cutting edge VR technologies, but ultimately had a hard time convincing investors to spend more money with the company and in VR technology. That's a look at a few of the things we'll be tracking in the coming week. Join Megan Maroney and me on Tech News Today every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern here on twit.tv. Thank you, Jason Howell. We're talking the week's tech news. Let's talk about that Bitcoin split because I don't understand it very well. But let me, let me preface this with a little explainer. Bitcoin 
is what we call a cryptocurrency. Uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of it by now. It's not backed by any government or by any institution at all. Its value, it's a total what we call a fiat currency. Its value is just what people are willing to pay for, what the co consensual hallucination is that it's worth. It's currently worth a lot, like 2000 a coin. 2600 or so? It's a lot of money. Um, although there's very famous stories about people, there's a guy who paid, uh, bought a pizza with like five bitcoins, so like a ten thousand oh, dollar pizza. It was, it was more than that. Two thousand bitcoins for two pizzas. He paid. He paid two thousand bitcoins for two pizzas. That works out to, according <laughs> to my math, forty five trillion dollars for two pizzas. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> so he's kicking himself. Uh, the problem with <laughs> Bitcoin was created by a person or persons we don't know, uh, pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. No one's ever found Satoshi, despite uh, many articles claiming to have found him. He's never been found. It may not exist. Whoever he is, he owns a lot of Bitcoin, which is one of the problems I have with all of these cryptocurrencies is it's a little bit of a pyramid scheme because if you invent a popular cryptocurrency, you get to keep a lot of money. Because you mine early on. Right, right. when it's cheap. Uh, of course, you're betting that it's going to become popular. Bitcoin is mathematically fascinating because, and whoever Satoshi is, was brilliant, uh, because among other things, the coins are created over a period of time, over a period of, I think, tw there's a pool you can create at something like 20 years. They'll, at some point, it will max out at the total of, there won't be any more Bitcoins. Otherwise, it would become inflationary, right? You can't print Bitcoins. They just come into existence through a very complicated mathematical process. Basically, it's kind of like prime factoring. It's something that takes a lot of horsepower, but it's cleverly conceived because as it goes, it gets harder and harder to mine Bitcoin. And it's actually tracked pretty closely to the cost of electricity. So, Because otherwise you would just, and people do this. I have a friend who's done this. He's taken over his garage. He's bought a lot of GPU powered Bitcoin mining equipment, spending lots of money for it. He powers cheap, fortunately, lives in Arizona. And that's the only reason this is financially feasible because it costs him so much to create the Bitcoin. And yet he still makes money because the net, because power is cheap, is, is positive. At least it was the last time I talked to him. I don't know if it still is. But there's a bigger problem for people who use Bitcoin, and that is the blockchain itself. One of the strengths of Bitcoin is there's no central bank. Correct me, by the way, guys, if I'm saying anything wrong, this is just my... You're doing like a B plus, mm -hmm. I think, so far. My, so just keep going. Keep rolling. If I say anything wrong, fix it. Um, the blockchain is the entire database of all Bitcoin transactions. All transactions are associated with a long, unique number. You have one, I have one, everyone in the wallet has one. So, uh, and the database contains everybody with a number and every transaction they've made. And the reason this works is because it's everybody who has a Bitcoin wallet on their computer has the entire blockchain. They have a copy of the database, which is approaching... I, it, you, it's hard to get the actual number, like 100 gigabytes. It's, it's, huge. it's large. It's huge. And there's a problem. Bitcoin is getting slower and slower to get. If, some, if I pay you some Bitcoin, it used to take no time at all. Now it might take a considerably long time for you to get the Bitcoin because of this blockchain bloat. And there's been discussion of raising the size of each individual block up from one megabyte if I'm not too far from my skis here. And that's slightly been resolved now through the latest Bitcoin, what quote, quote, civil war we saw resolved in the last well, week. Well, this is the problem. There's the Bitcoin Foundation, which Satoshi handed off the reins to, uh, and I had him on triangulation. We had a great interview with him, Andres Anderson. Anderson. Oh, yeah. Gavin, yeah. Gavin, what is his name? Gavin Ad Anderson. Uh, and uh, uh, Gavin's pulled out of this, right? Because it was a big political battle between some Bitcoin miners who didn't want the algorithm to change and people who realized the algorithm in the long run was not going to do well. Um, I hope somebody can explain the current politics better than I can. You said, Alex, when we were in the promo that this is going to be an issue. I've played myself because I have not been watching Bitcoin as close as I should in the last couple of weeks. Because I think like a lot of us who cover this space even a little bit, we've been watching the ICO market. And uh, Ethereum. That's another story. Yeah. But uh, we'll get to um, ICOs next. Yeah, ICOs are, are fascinating. But um, the point is, Bitcoin's working through some maturity hurdles, you could say. Uh, and its community has come together after a potential problem uh, implementing what's called SEGWIT, Segwit, Seg, Sedgwit. I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, but things I'm mostly calling Whenever out. you say that, I play that music. Go ahead, say it again. Watch this Segwit. 
I want a better theme song. That, that's just <laughs> that's that's like that's like Mashable style. That's weak. I want some Buzzfeed stuff. So Bitcoin was able to avoid uh, a split, um, but Segwit two X, which will increase network capacity. Uh, and avoid this damaging fork. You don't want a fork because then you've got two Bitcoins. Right. That are mutually incompatible. Right. But then the idea is Bitcoin Cash is going to be launched, I think it's on August 1st or discussed on August 1st, and it's an attempt to increase the throughput of Bitcoin, making it more efficient on a per-transaction basis. Because right now, so much compute energy and therefore electricity goes into each individual transaction, it's slow and a little bit inefficient. So if Bitcoin you, Cash, which starts Tuesday, will have a bigger block size than yes. Bitcoin. After the Segwit 2x has already been applied, right? You know what? The problem when you get it's into this is on. there are Bitcoin nut jobs who are going to now email me for the next six weeks saying, Leo, you got this so wrong. I, I, yeah. And I, I, and I apologize. I know I'm getting it a little bit wrong. There's also Ethereum, which is another cryptocurrency that has some security issues. Recently, the largest bank heist in the world, $31 million of Ethereum stolen because someone changed their wordpress page to give a different address <laughs> where people could send money to buy into the ico and they didn't notice for a while in fact it almost thing, right? was 180 million ethereum dollars worth of ethereum Poof. but people started pulling the plugs out of their machines right. real quick yeah stop stop that one uh, so blockchain's a good uh, is i think a good technology it's an interesting technology it does have this problem with it the database is stored everywhere it's distributed uh that's not a bad thing but it is a technical issue when you have a lot of transactions. But you have to get everyone to agree. So with Segwit, or Seg, Segwit, I guess probably closer, um, they had to have a certain number of people signaling that they wanted to move to it in the mining groups. And so the people that run these vast mining pools that provide the core power. And that's really, the mine. The miners are the, all the power. A lot of them are in China. And I've met Chandler from, well, I think it was, was it Ant Pool? I forget. From, from, from um, uh, Friends? Because he's my favorite friend. No, no, not, not Chandler from Friends. Oh. Chandler from China, who works in Bitcoin. Okay. Um, like two years, two years ago. I mean, close though. It's almost the same person. Yeah. They look dramatically the same. Um, How and, you doing? Oh, no, gosh. That's another that's, guy. That's, that's Joey. That's Joey. <laughs> that's Joey. <laughs> and Joey, little you know, is actually based off of Leo's youth. Um, yeah. yeah. When I lived in Queens. Uh, that's another story. That's not... Anyways. So, Bitcoin Cash will launch on Tuesday, and everybody who has Bitcoin, which includes... I have seven Bitcoins you somewhere. You have seven Bitcoin? Yeah, somewhere. I can't remember my password to the wallet. Oh, my gosh. So, anyway, I'll find it. But uh, my son says, please, Dad, let me try. <laughs> so, uh, uh... You tell your son that password, you'll have no Everybody Bitcoin. who has Bitcoin, including, I guess, me, will get Bitcoin Cash uh, the day of the fork. There's already a futures market... Uh, currently, Bitcoin cash value, 13% of Bitcoin's price. Mm. So when the bit Bitcoin split happens, this is according to Fortune magazine, something like $6 billion in new market value will poof go into existence. It's the poofing of these cryptocurrencies that I think bothers people. But remember, the U.S. dollar is essentially a fiat currency. It's only worth what we say it is. It's a piece of paper. But you can use it to pay your U.S. government debts, which right. is why it has can't value. can't do that with Bitcoin. I can pay my taxes in dollars. I can't pay them in Bitcoin or euros or anything else. Yeah. Well, yeah. also, you understand a piece of paper at the end of the day. I'll the give you a piece person. of paper that says one Bitcoin if that makes you feel better. But that's the thing. I think the average person assumes that because right. cash and existing currencies have existed. When when did we go off the gold standard? A hundred years ago? Yeah. Um, like, um, but the can fact I just that point that out? Exists, everybody thinks the gold standard was some sort of magical thing. Gold doesn't. Gold is not worth what you pay an ounce for it. Oh, the industrial no. value. No. Of gold, that's a fiat currency, really, too. Right. <laughs> just don't tell Ron Paul. Sure. So, I mean, th these, th what a fiat currency is, is something that has value because everybody agrees it has value, not because it has intrinsic value. Even and also because there's an army backing it up, too. Well, the army doesn't. Yeah. Have <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing with Bitcoin. What is there backing it up? If you try right. to explain, I mean, we just took like five minutes to explain the process of this. You can't do that. Like, people just understand the value of, right. of a dollar, right? And, and so no I, one I wants. That's why people are confused. And no one wants to bring up the fiat currency thing because no one wants to undermine the full faith and credit of the U.S. dollar, right? Mm. If we really started yeah. saying, well, it's just a pretend thing, that would be bad. Even, you know, so. But everyone knows that, right? No one, no. Wait, really? I don't think the average person It's one does. of those things that you know, but you don't, it's in the what back the and you don't think about know, it. Then, Mike? We I all mean, know we're going to die, but we don't think about it. I mean, I do. Exactly. Gets me through some sad days. I'm like, well, it's going to end eventually. <laughs> Fuck up. It's all right. You're going to get a, a another role of the character die. <sighs> all right. And it'll be great this time. It was 1879 we left the gold standard. 
There you 1879. Go. Uh-huh. It's been a long time. Uh, That's when Leo left Queens. So <laughs> I'm going to leave it. To, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, I'm sorry. That was, I was No, I no. That. I was, I was, uh, I was, uh, I lived in the uh, five corners. I was in one of the fire department. It was great. It was, those were the good days. I carried an ax, didn't use it for fires, but that's another story. Let's, um, let's ask the chat room. Cause I bet you there's people in the chat room who are serious Bitcoin knobs. I'm going to use that word. And <laughs> Does that mean something different in this country? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the UK. That's not. Oh, funny. okay. Never mind. Uh, uh, never mind. We'll just. Okay, we're done. We're done. I just. Something's going to happen on Tuesday. The world will go on, but there will be some people, including Joey in China, no, Chandler in China, who will be. Will he be upset? He will be upset because he's a Bitcoin miner. I presume anything that makes Bitcoin worth more per coin, he's fine with. And since I've met him, it's appreciated, what, 4X? So I yeah. think he's, he's I think made he's a lot of great. money now. Yeah, I'm very jealous. The problem is, when do you sell your Bitcoin? Because you sell it now at 2600 bucks and become like the pizza guy? Oh, I, that could have been worth a million. I think you sell until you feel like you have enough money to take on more risk. I mean, you sell down to the sleeping point is the old school investment advice here. Um, you have seven Bitcoin. I would sell two, keep five, and then sell... Two more when it doubles, and two more and doubles then, again. Then you're you know? doing what they say in the casino. You're you're betting the bank's money. Exactly. Yeah. I stole my Apple stock. I don't know. I didn't want to talk about that. <laughs> so early. <laughs> oh, I well, I don't own any tech stock. I don't think I ever owned any Apple stock. But we have a guy, uh, Scott Bourne, who was on our Mac Break podcast many years ago, and I said you can't be on the podcast if you have Apple stock. So he sold his, and he's never <gasps> forgiven me. <laughs> what year was this? <laughs> I don't want to say. <laughs> what what year was it, Leo? 2006. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, that's like right when they went Intel, right? Yeah, or around then. <laughs> yeah, he's actually very gracious about the whole thing, but I know that secretly he wants to kill me. I mean, oh my god, I, I would. Too. Yeah, I don't blame him. Uh, but that's our policy here. You've all sold your tech stocks, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't add. You're, I'm sure Business Insider doesn't let you have tech stocks, right? No, or any stocks. Oh, no stocks at all. But yeah, you can yeah. own index I mean, funds. Well, that's kind of guaranteeing yeah. poverty. And I can old own age. index, and I and oh, I index can, funds. What? Yeah, that's what. And I, I have four hundred one k, and I can have that kind of stuff. Fact, but I can't go out there and buy Apple or technically something. Technically, I do have tech stocks because I invest uh, in the S and P five hundred index funds. So I do. Right. But yeah, no me too. That that's diversified, and I don't control it. And it's right. not. That's why it's okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I have my, all my money in the Vanguard five hundred index. Exactly. Fund. That's right. what exactly the same investment vehicle I'm in. But because we did that, we wouldn't have gotten a thirteen hundred and forty percent gain on our apple stock since 2006 leo you you took that guy's house away he had from a him. lot oh he had my a lot gosh. too it wasn't like oh i got five bucks in apple stock it was tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars it you was, owe him like five million dollars yeah is what i'm saying he's a very nice guy he's going to be uh, on, t on back in the studio and uh, on the new screen savers i think he's going to do twit too or no macbrick weekly in he lives in a box now Scott but he's, he's doing great <laughs> He's so mad. I, I would just burn every morning waking up being like, this could be a mansion. Instead, it's cardboard. And I'm, at, I'm at 6 1,000. Does he have an iPhone? Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. Constant reminder. <laughs> every time he looks at his phone, he thinks of me. I'm sure uh, his phone is Let's eyes. take a break. I'm depressed now. <laughs> Our, show <today. laughs> Our show today brought to you by Carbonite Online. Back up you. Uh, I swear to God, you got to back up because it's just getting worse out there. Ransomware. The estimate last for last year's ransomware attacks, it's kind of interesting. The, the amount of money paid to ransomware hackers is pitiful. It's like $25 million. The amount of productivity loss, $50 billion. But that's because ransomware rips the heart out of your business. If you've got a business and all your stuff's on your computer, you're client list, your accounts receivable, all your financials, all your emails, everything, and somebody goes along and encrypts it and takes it away from you, boom, you're done. I mean, you could, you really could be out of business unless you've got a good backup. What's a good backup? A backup off-site, so it's safe from all kinds of disasters, including acts of God. A backup that's encrypted, a backup with versioning, so you can always go back in time to that pre-encrypted, this is Carbonite. And if you're in a business and you are not protecting your most valuable asset, your data, you are just, it's like not buying 
insurance. You gotta. You have fire insurance. You need Carbonite. Go to Carbonite.com. They're for home or office. If you're in the office section, click the resources uh, button, and you'll see a bunch of white papers about uh, ransomware, ransomware mitigation. Actually, this is a. This is all free to you. Very useful stuff. Create a disaster recovery plan, and a big part of that is Carbonite.com. You could try it free right now. Uh, no credit card needed. They can't charge you even if they wanted to. They don't. They they know if you try it, you're going to understand how great this is. It's for a home. It's automatic. You install it on your computer. You forget about it. And whenever you're online, you're backing up. For business, they have plans for servers. They even have the eVault, which is a, a local hardware backup that then backs up uh, to Carbonite. Uh, it protects you with off-site backup. you got to try it. Free to try. Carbonite.com. But do me a favor, use the offer code TWIT uh, when you try it right there in the offer code and you'll get two free, free uh, months if you decide to buy. Prote even if it's not Carbonite, I'm telling you, do this. Try Carbonite. You can try anything else you want. It's so important nowadays. Protect your business. Carbonite.com is what we do. Use the offer code TWIT. I feel like the the ads on the show are increasingly about security and like data privacy. Yeah. Like I wonder what if that's surprise. indicative of the world what we're a in surprise. now. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not like Blue Apron. Try it out. It's like your well, stuff will be stolen. Be sad. Buy this now. Actually, no, because, no Blue Apron today. I mean, it's we do still it, have the Blue Apron ads. Ransomware stuff. It is. Uh, hey, here's happy news. This is gonna cheer us all up. Apple is teaming up with Cochlear. You know, Cochlear does these implants, right? They actually can help. Deaf people hear, and I know a number of people with cochlear implants. It's remarkable. Maybe you saw the video of the girl who never heard, and she heard for the first time. And, I mean, if you didn't cry, you got a heart of stone because it was amazing. Apple's teaming up with cochlear. They're going to make the first iPhone cochlear implant. So it will stream sound directly from a compatible iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch to the sound processor, which then communicates with surgically embedded implants in your cochlea to help people who have never heard hear again. Vince Cerf's wife uh, is congenital, was congenitally deaf. And I remember talking to Vince about this, father of the internet. Uh, and it, he, the, the day she heard his voice for the first time, can you imagine what that's like? No, actually I can't. But is this just for sound hearing is it to improve your hearing or then why does it need the iphone when these worked without smartphones before it does it it would use a microphone or something else on your hip oh but okay. as long as you've got a smartphone why not use that uh, for it as so well so it's just a step forward using smartphones. well it's another way of it's another there there have been in the past in fact my hearing aids my starkeys uh use i have an ios app ios has built into it in its accessibility uh features they have uh made for iphone hearing aids you can connect to that and actually, it's it's actually pretty awesome when somebody cool. call somebody calls me, it'll go if I want I can go through the hearing aid so I can just talk to somebody I can listen to, don't tell my wife this I can listen to audio books uh, at dinner all the time I listen. <laughs> all the time. You do uh, know this is recorded, right? <laughs> no, she's watching. She knows. She's watching right now. Actually, I'll never forget the day that we wanted to hear like it was the World Series. I remember when you, are you guys old enough to remember going to school and listening to the World Series on a, on a transistor radio? You probably aren't. Oh my no. god, I'm so old. <laughs> so You're not. Lee. Yeah, if the Red Sox were playing in the World Series, which they weren't, but if they were, <laughs> you would you would hope that the teacher didn't notice that you had a thing in your ear going down your shirt because you had a transistor radio so you could hear the game in school. Oh, we did that with um, sweatshirts and the old Discmans because you could thread the headphones through <laughs> oh, the yeah, little pocket. Okay, close oh, enough. Yeah. And we could play the Linkin Park album in sixth grade. See, now I don't care. It's my hearing yeah. aids. I don't have to leave those in and I can... But so at one point, Lisa and I were trying to listen to something. I, I lent her my hearing aid and she could hear and I, it worked great. It's That's amazing. That's the romance is still real. That's true romance, man. <laughs> honey, it's my hearing aid. Here you go. Here you go, honey. <laughs> so, it off first. Uh, so th w there are things you get, uh, a benefit you get, I know with the hearing aids, and I would guess this is true of the cochlear implant. For instance, because the iPhone has GPS built in, you can set up different profiles. So for a restaurant, you definitely want the hearing aid to do different things. You don't want to amplify all that noise. Mm -hmm. A movie, sitting in your living room watching TV. And so the phone can say, oh, you're, I know where you are. I will adjust your sound automatically. Actually, that was one of the reasons I got it. I thought it was so cool. Um, you also probably get, easier to get than AirPods too. Yeah, right. <laughs> I couldn't afford. I couldn't find an Air, AirPods, so I just got a cochlear implant instead. <laughs> I got uh, surgery instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then Doppler Labs is making the uh, the AirPod equivalents, like the little earpiece headphones um, that do the sound dampening as well, based on the environment you're in. So this is probably where everything's going to go. Absolutely. 
I like that. Absolutely. You guys, when you get to be my age, you probably won't get hearing aids. Uh, you'll just keep your earbuds in. <laughs> right. Well, if you just well, staple your AirPods. I thought that was actually the best possible use for an AirPod, right? And I was disappointed that Apple, but it, battery life's not long enough. It would kill it. Mm. Yeah. But that, and there's legislation going through where they are not going to be medical devices anymore, where you can just go to Target or something and buy them. And uh, that will be a, a game changer uh, for the hearing aid industry and for companies like Doppler, oh, for Apple. Can I for tell you the, something? Uh, hearing aids, what a scam. Yeah. Six thousand dollars. Right. Six I mean, come on. Really? Does it come with five thousand dollars in cash? <laughs> uh <laughs> well I I guess they figure everybody's insurance is paying for it or something. Medical devices, it's a scam all around, right? So uh Doppler Labs did those earbuds that weren't so good. That was the dash. Was that the oh that was Broggy. That's Braggy. Yeah. So these are these better? Have you tried these? I just know those are they're really cool. I've tried them before. They it's cool how it can uh, you know filter out certain sounds and things like that, like in the office or a plane. But the battery life is terrible on them right now. See, that's the problem. And they come just like the AirPods with a case that has a battery mm -hmm. in it. But that's not yeah. If you can only get half an hour, I mean, what was the battery like like? Like, uh, like three hours maybe. Something well, like that's that. not awful. Yeah, it just means you can't wear them all the time. You have to yeah. right. Yeah, but I wear my AirPods in like thirty-minute bursts, like when I'm walking right. to Me too. Whole Foods or the or bodega. <laughs> <On your own. laughs> when I'm Back walking to the bodega, Maybe that's actually the main use case I have. They don't I sell think, cigarettes. I Whole think Foods. we need a, a musical theme. Walk into the bodega <laughs> for Alex. As long as you sing it, I'll dance to it. You won't be able to get an iPod Nano or a Shuffle. The Shuffle has shuffled off the mortal coil. Apple silently killed them on Thursday. Now, if you want an iPod, God knows why you would want an iPod. If you want an iPod, you have to get a Touch, which starts at 200 bucks. I guess for kids, right? Yeah. Uh, but everybody else has it's a It's a phone. starter device for the iPhone. If you're right. 10 years old and your parents don't want you to have a phone, it's great. My first but iPod. I, I still want an iPod, to be honest. I actually wish I, I found, when I was looking for these headphones to come on here, I found the thing that these were attached to, which was an iPod Classic from like a decade ago. And it doesn't work anymore because who has those like big connectors? But it's a, I kind of, it's a 30 pin connector. Yeah, wow. yeah I forgot the number. <laughs> wow. But like, you know, I, I kind of like that I had a device that just had 80 gigabytes of music and I didn't have to like, you know, stream over my da expensive data connection to like listen to every piece of music I ever have owned. Oh, why would you want to do that? How many how many songs is 80 gigs? I totally forget the uh, so, conversion. So I, when they killed the classic, which was a few years ago, that was the 160 gig okay. iPod. I bought one because I thought, this is it. It's over. I have 260 gig iPod classics, but I don't ever use them because as I, you know, yeah. I've got my phone even for audiobooks, and, and I can get enough music on a 128 gig iPhone. I don't need to really worry about ever worry about an iPod. What? My phone's all full of photos. John, you want it? I, I already gave great. it to my mom. I put all, <laughs> I put all my music on one and I put all my audio books on another and I sent it to my mom. She has a dock. She still has a dock. She has two docks. She got a tower speaker with a dock in it, so she can listen to music and uh, iPhones. I, I'm sorry, John. I would have given it to you, but my mother carried me for nine months. What have you done lately? <laughs> <laughs> got me a cup of coffee. That's okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I agree with. I'm kind of with you, Mike. I. These will become fetish, and there are a lot of people upset about the loss of the Nano and the Shuffle. If you go to the gym, a lot of people wearing Nanos. Yeah, well, right? they should have bought more of them, and Apple wouldn't have canceled them. You don't, yeah, that's maybe that's true. You don't want to wear mm -hmm. an eye. I do see people wearing phones on their uh, biceps. That's not a good look. Why is that? Especially oh, I was like, going to buy one of those, actually. Why is that not a good look? Well, so I don't know. big, yeah. right? Yeah, like, yeah, it's know, the size that... of my face. Like, it's too big for my non muscular arms. Well, that's why <laughs> you're going to the gym, Mike. <laughs> You can come yeah. with us, man. Beef them up. <laughs> yeah, I have one of those straps, but look it. But unless you had a smaller phone, this is the seven plus. Yeah, Mike's not, absolutely right. I mean, but yeah. I don't care if I look dumb in the gym, though. I'm already sweaty you're right. You already look dumb. No, like, you're right. You already. Look I, I don't look like, good. It's anyways. like awkward. I like uh, when I used to be able to run. I, I strapped my you know six plus or yeah six plus I guess, and it. It just felt weird, you know, like it's such a big thing on your arm. I don't know. Like back in the day when I had an iPod Nano or whatever, that was fine. And they're great for runners. And Apple's like argument now is, oh, just get an Apple Watch, even though that is like not the best device, right? And they want you to wear it all the time, but actually it's only a device for, you know, using when you're working out. Like 
I can't square that circle. And maybe it would be easier if you just still sold a music player. Well, I think that's what we kind of concluded was that Apple would prefer that you bought a watch. But who wants to get a watch? And this only has four know. gigs of storage. I mean, I guess four gigs. Yeah, Ugh. you can put four gigs of music on. Well, <laughs> I mean, how long do you work out? <laughs> <laughs> Very high bitrate songs is the actual answer to that question. Oh, okay. No, I, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, four gigs of songs. I feel like if I put them on shuffle and I worked out, you know, for two weeks with that playlist, I would get super bored of it. Well, put then you just. I don't want to update my watch. Come on, like <laughs> I don't go home and think like, what's more stuff I can do with my devices today? <laughs> yeah, my, my Mac profile is actually turn off. Didn't you, Mike, uh, wrote an uh, article saying, why would anybody want to buy an Apple Watch? This was last year, I think. Yeah, that, uh, that, was, that was something I wrote that Apple uh, has made their feelings very clear about. Oh, you don't times. get invited to events anymore either, huh? I, I finally do, but they told me that the reason I didn't was... What? Yeah. They told you that that was... See, they've always denied there's a blacklist, but they said to you, we're not oh, going to invite you. definitely a blacklist. Oh, there's yeah, a blacklist. A we blacklist. Were on, I was on the blacklist for a while. There's yeah. always a blacklist. Yeah. So I haven't yeah. been invited to an Apple event uh, since the <laughs> iPad announcement in 2010 when I, everybody was doing it. They had all these cameras behind me. I turned my <laughs> laptop around and I streamed it. Oh, yeah, that's a big no. But Steve saw me and he looked at me and I, I swear to God, he went, <laughs> and, I, and I never got another uh, invitation. But I think that that was just, you know, chance. That uh, doesn't sound like know. chance. Apple's press events are not left to chance. So I would really like to go see the new spaceship campus. And I'm hoping that I could get an invite to the September iPhone 10th anniversary event for old time's sake. What do you say, Mike? Let's go. Let's call them up. Let's say, come on. Be nice. Come right? on. What's the statute of limitations? Come on. You want to call him up? Yeah, I, probably, you know I feel like I'm probably getting uninvited right now from the next one. No, but, no, no. Okay. I don't know him. Mike is not. <laughs> We're not I, friends. We're not friends. It's okay, <laughs> Apple. We're not friends. So, but I mentioned I had a story about the Atlantic. I mean, about Quartz. Because wasn't Quartz a spinoff of Atlantic? It's still uh, part of the Atlantic Media Group. Are you? And that, that is now a very confusing term as of Friday at 3 a.m. Because Laureen Powell Jobs... And I don't want to be the guy who says Steve Jobs' widow, but I guess I better. Uh, wonder, by the way, wonderful person. I uh, really, uh, I really admire her. She has a group she calls the Emerson Collective, named after Ralph Waldo Emerson. So now you know she's an intellectual. Uh, it turns out Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson created the Atlantic. Did you know that? I did not know. He that. was actually a financier. I looked into this. He was not a founder. He put money up, which, you know, kind of interesting what the Emerson Collective does, right? So huh. she's put a, she has a little bit of money. Oh. Steve, Steve had a retirement account and she put a little bit of that money into buying the Atlantic from, uh, yeah. yeah. So is she now your boss? So it's an interesting uh, structure and a bunch of the articles, actually that one was right, but a bunch of them were wrong. And Lorraine Powell Jobs now has the controlling share of the Atlantic magazine. Ah, but not Atlantic the Media Group, which contains the magazine, uh, she has no share in. So she has no share in the courts, uh, government executive, National okay. Journal, okay. Um, all of that stuff. So David Bradley is still very much our owner for as far as I know ever. Interesting. She's uh, uh, Lorreen has $20 billion. She's the number one, uh, at least... I think maybe they sold their stake, but she was the number one shareholder in Disney. Wow. Um, and she apparently owns um, a Hollywood studio. Uh, she's supported ProPublica and the Marshall Project. So she's very apparently interested in media. Um, and uh, when she was asked at the Code Conference last May if she would ever consider buying something like the New York Times, she said, is it for sale? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I wish I had that kind of money. <laughs> uh, this is not unprecedented. Chris Hughes, Facebook millionaire, briefly owned and almost killed the New Republic. The New, the New Republic, which I love, but I think it was he was not a good steward. Of course, Jeff Bezos currently owns the Post and has done, I think, a very good job. And what did Kushner buy? He bought the New York Observer, the Observer. Yeah. yeah, and sold it. Oh, he, oh, he doesn't. Yeah, oh, he, he just he's he, not involved in it anymore. He got rid yeah. of it. Yeah. So I love the Atlantic. I think the Atlantic is fantastic. Me too. Uh, and I hope that she keep. I think she will keep it. You, you had to say that, didn't you? 
I, I, no, there's, there's definitely no one right outside the frame saying. And it's not. It's not. <laughs> right the it's no longer related, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, it's an odd, odd structure, which I was meant to. A- I meant to ask, uh, but you know, it was a, a big day. So the, um, the big no, thing. I think it'll be fine. The big thing about the Atlantic, and I've really admired the Atlantic, is they of uh, a lot of older publications do not handle the digital transition well. Mm. The Atlantic, of all of them, maybe even better than the New York Times, has done an excellent job. Uh, I see Atlantic articles in a lot of my feeds. I refer to them a lot. I think they've done a very good job of keeping, uh, you know, James Fallows writes for them. They, they get a very good job of staying relevant in the digital age, even though they're 160 years old. They're one of my favorite airport buys. And whenever Game of Thrones is over, I go immediately to the Atlantic to figure out what the hell just happened. <laughs> that's, by the way, that's, <laughs> that is the new form of journalism that I like, the roundtables discussing shows on hbo or netflix or the we just launched one of those for game of thrones that we're doing every monday called joffrey's place oh i great. love it <laughs> and, it's on quartz um, are you in there yeah it's on uh, i was actually on last week even though i've watched the show like twice and i don't get it so they they take someone they make someone watch an episode every week and go <laughs> what, what do you happened think? and then you're supposed to like make it no up and figure it out clue. so i did that this week um, but yeah, it's awesome. Like that's a that's a thing we're doing, and we're doing it for Game of Thrones. And I think probably you know with our awesome TV writer um, Adam Epstein, we'll probably do more stuff like that. But is like, it a podcast it, only? It's uh... it's uh, on our Facebook page. Actually, I oh, think cool. it's on our new Facebook page, uh, Quartzy, which is our new like lifestyle section. Um, but last week's was on the Quartz Facebook page as well. Yeah, because I don't see it on the on Quartz, QZ.com. Quartzy, no, no, that's this is the no. wrong Quartzy. This is definitely Start the different. wrong Quartzy. How do you spell uh, Quartzy? <laughs> I did it wrong too. Quartz, oh, why? Oh no, I'm in the right place. Is it? Is it an orange logo? Yeah, that's it. Uh, oh no? no, you know that company. That's so weird. I was reporting uh, a story in uh, Wisconsin, middle of nowhere. The story on self-driving trucks that went up like a couple weeks ago. But I got off. <laughs> I got off the uh, interstate. There's just this giant billboard saying Quartzy. I'm like, they knew I was coming. <laughs> but apparently it's some other company. Well, I'm going to do what Quartz everybody is. does when you can't find something on Facebook, Apple, anywhere. You Google it. Mm-hmm. And there it yeah, is, Joffrey's it. Place. That is a great picture. We'll be starting shortly. So they do it as a Facebook live stream? Yeah, it's like a roundtable just like this, but only on Game of Thrones. Wow. I hate it, but I would totally watch that. Well, It's really good. Yeah. I'll be honest. I'll watch, and this has happened with House of Cards too, but Game of Thrones especially, I will watch it. And I spent a lot of time going, I feel like an old man now. Who's he? What is he doing? Who's that? Why'd they kill him? What? <laughs> She's who? A lot. And so I need these things, these explainers. And then I'll read it and go, oh, oh. Uh, here's in the Atlantic, Leanna Mormont and the slogan feminism of Game of Thrones. See, this is exactly, this is... This is I, there's stuff going on in these shows I just don't like. Leo, this I didn't even know this is who Liana Mormont. She's a little kid, but she's like talking like a grown up. She said, "Let's go." I uh, you're his, and it, and it's like, what? Who is this little kid? And why? <laughs> she's from Bear Island, right? Yeah, she's from Bear Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that character. Yeah, she's amazing. <laughs> yeah, she bullies around all the cowardly old men, and it's great. And then it helps out John Snow, well, like so her. that way he can get together with. Khaleesi and take over Westeros and kill Cersei. Come on, it's awesome. And you say you've never seen this show? Oh, I've seen all of it. Oh, okay. Like Five hundred times. No, I've never seen it, and so this is all just gibberish. Yeah, my. No, uh, I've seen it, and it's gibberish. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's too many characters. Yeah, we we don't we our brain isn't wired to think I, that way. That's why this content has to exist. Okay, but I can't take politics all day, and I need to have some things I do during the week that are just non. Politics. She, Leona Mormont, according to the Atlantic, is just the video per, uh, personification of the fearless girl statue on Wall Street. And I think that's actually true. The, okay. I, uh, well, see, these are the, these are the ca- the ca- cultural connections that these these uh, this new kind of form of media does. I love. Donald Trump says Apple has promised. <laughs> Promised to build three <laughs> manufacturing plants plants in the U.S. Apple declined to comment. <laughs> Nor did they say where or when these plants would be, what they would do, who they would hire. And then Foxconn made an announcement, right? And then Foxconn, which is not Apple but does assemble the iPhone, said, we're going to build a plant in Wisconsin to make sharp televisions. 
If you're a person though who thinks that Amazon owns the Washington Post, don't you think you can make yeah, a mistake you might. about maybe that was if a Apple owns yeah, Foxconn? Maybe I was thinking of exactly Foxconn. What I think happened. Okay. He, yeah. he thinks Foxconn is Apple, and he, and he heard that Foxconn makes iPhone, so he just assumed it was okay. an Apple factory. Right. Yeah, that's probably what can it was. Can you imagine <laughs> the Apple executive suite reading this tweet, going, "What? Are, did you? Did I can imagine we? Tim slowly <laughs> scrolling up like?" <sighs> Oh, Why? <laughs> so let's talk about the campus. Very, you know, there have been great articles. Stephen Levy's article in the Wired, uh, the most recent in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, how Johnny Ive masterminded Apple's new headquarters. And you read along. Oh, I got to log in to, to read it. But you read along, and and I actually pay for the Wall Street Journal, so I could do that, but I don't have my YubiKey with me, and it's a long story. But anyway, there you go. You got it. If you read along, pretty soon there's a little trouble in paradise because it's it's apparently <laughs> there's no really for the programmers' offices. Uh, there's just big tables, and even meetings are held. Everybody's and there's not enough whiteboards, and even already some people are saying, ah, "This is not good." So this is an example of what happens when you say you know you empower a master designer like Johnny Ive. Just just do whatever you think's best. And Johnny goes, okay. It turns out industrial design and interior design are not <laughs> the exact same discipline. Well, and it's interesting because Johnny says, I don't think of this as architecture. I think of it as a product. That's a so bad obnoxious. Sign. That is a bad <laughs> sign. It's, it is obnoxious. I, I think Mike's right. Like th that level of pretension just makes me want to vomit in my own hands. <laughs> yeah, Dieter Rams never built a building for a reason. He didn't know yeah. what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the the broader point about open workspaces or what we call open floor plans in Silicon Valley being the bane of programmers is actually too small of a point in my view. I think it's the bane for all of us. I mean, I yeah. work in an office right now. There it is. This plan. is what it's going to look like when you come into work. That looks like hell. It's an Apple store. It's an Apple it store. It looks like an yes. Apple store. It's like Apple store and Dilbert got together. It's yeah. Just, it's <laughs> just terrible. I don't want to work combo. there. The building from the outside is amazing. But let's talk about the larger issue, because I think you're right. I think that one of the problems about working in a company at this point is there are some people who don't want to work, and they don't want you to work mm. because you're making them look bad. And those people will go around from cubicle to cubicle bugging you so that you can't get anything done. And it's really hard if you're a programmer. Your mind is focused. You're in the, Or a writer. You probably have the same exact issue. You're really in the zone, and then somebody says, so what do you think of them, uh, them, them bears, huh? Drives me nuts. Yeah, it must be very hard. Nobody I've, dares do that here, right? We're we're working here, John. <laughs> or let's, oh, it's time for a meeting. That's my favorite. There's an hour lost forever. Into the void. But I think everyone suffers from open floor plans, not yes. just programmers. So I think that Apple made a really serious mistake here. You can't solve it with cubicle walls. You need actual walls with actual doors. Shit, now we're not going to get... Invited to that event. I would take a thirty percent pay cut if I had a door. <laughs> We're screwed, Mike. I like my open floor plan. Am I? Am I, <laughs> this am I the only one? I think the, it's a great idea. Wait, no, I want to hear why. I, I, I want to hear why. Yeah. Um, especially why? Well, I, I mean, I work in a newsroom, and I love being able to just shout and collaborate. Aren't they traditionally the like that? Head? Right. The Chronicles. It's, yeah. It's so you can go yeah, it's copy, thing. and the copy boy comes and takes your. No, 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 no. no. Wrong. That, we, we don't have those. Anymore. There's no copy boys. There's no copy that would editors. Staff. Clearly, there's yeah. not even any copy editors anymore. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell my copy editor. Um, no, I think you're, and I think that that's the, actually the thinking behind this Apple floor plan is that communication. He says, I want right. I want people to look at each other and talk to each other, but it can be antithetical to production productivity, right? right. Now, for a, for a programmer, is that good? Maybe not. Uh, not every job is collaborative in that sense. Um, so, yeah, I can see that being annoying. I like my open floor plan. Microsoft, though. I love it. Microsoft has offices for every single engineer. They have Microsoft own, office? Yeah, private office. <laughs> so does what? Why Why are they laughing? Microsoft office. Oh. Oh. I thought they were laughing because I forced them to sit in an open floor plan. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I think that's a fair point, right? Like, Especially given what Apple's history is. I mean, you know, Brian Merchant just wrote that great book about the first iPhone and how it was, oh, um, yeah. you know, built. And they, you know, they hit everyone in an office off site and couldn't talk about it. And they right. all had to live in a room where they like locked the doors. And now they're an open plan office company. That doesn't make any sense. It's antithetical to their own way that they've always worked. Open plan is how you get news traveling. And obviously in a newsroom, that's awesome. 
right. like my open plan office for for my you know newsroom that I work in. But if I were at Apple and I had the developers from one section working on something and perhaps you know cross contaminating with another section, that might actually be really uh, detrimental to not only productivity but you know secrecy, which they absolutely you know value. Well, they do have. To be fair, on the campus, that an R and D building that is a separate building that probably has good security, mm -hmm. and that's probably where the new stuff. I don't think Apple's going to abandon its secrecy by any means. I wonder if that's open plan, though. Oh God! <laughs> well, but but you just described the origin. The iPhone team was kind of in an open plan, right? They were really kind of all in it. But you're all working on the same thing. Yeah. And and maybe also because you're all working on the same thing, you have some respect for what the other person is doing. And sh he's writing the bootloader. Everybody leave him alone. Yeah, if we're working in a team, I want to be in the same room as you. But I think the problem that the picture right. you showed was a very long hallway. You can't have small teams that are that big. So well, it's we'll just going to be chaotic and noisy. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I will say, though, the most beautiful office building I've seen from the outside. It's gorgeous. Ever. It's just staggering. It's gorgeous. I, it's not that. done, though. I don't know. I mean, I was there for what? WWDC? I... I got lost and ended up in Cupertino because I had nothing better to do afterwards. And it was still a building site. I mean, that was like what, June 2nd or whatever. Oh, yeah. So maybe it wasn't quite done. But like, you know, that was right when Stephen Levy's piece went up and you're seeing these beautiful, clearly right. CJI photos because <laughs> I'm there and I'm like, there's still like those weird chain mail fences up saying, you know, building site hard hat area only, which is like kind of sucks. You have to go to work and like make sure you don't go in the hard hat entrance. Yeah. Um, That's like half a Soma, though. I mean, half a Soma is under construction yeah. at any given time, so yeah, it's not too different. Half of New York is, too. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's why New York is the worst. Joel Spolsky, we've had him on uh, Triangulation. He's a great guy, created Stack Overflow, uh, great programmer. Um, he says, just shut up and let your devs concentrate. <laughs> it's an article in GeekWire. Somebody in the chat room uh, passed this along. He was talking about Facebook's campus. He says it's an eight-acre open room, and Facebook was very pleased with itself for building what it thought was this amazing place for developers. But developers don't want to overhear conversations. That's ideal for a trading floor. Developers need to concentrate to go to a chat room and ask questions to get the answers later. Facebook is paying 50, 40 to 50% more than other places, which is usually a sign developers don't want to work there. Ooh. Or maybe they can just afford it. All right, we're going to talk about DEF CON when we come back. Did you go? Did anybody go to DEF CON? You guys have been covering it, I'm sure. I've been watching the uh, Insane Badge tweets for the last couple of days. All right, we'll talk about the Insane Badge, the robot that can crack safes. Yes. And um, some other news from the Hacker, Big Hacker Conference. But first, a word from WordPress.com. Did you know that 28% of all websites run on WordPress? 28%. Uh, Quartz, I believe, is one of those websites. It is indeed. Yeah. Uh, WordPress. I run my blog on WordPress. Now, I used WordPress, self-hosted WordPress for years, for like most of the 2000s. This is my blog. Uh, and I was, and I moved recently to WordPress.com, and I'm so thrilled. First of all, they keep it up to date. They keep it secure. They make sure everything's working. They've got great 24-7 support with smart people who are friendly and nice and helpful. They really make it easy to make a great site. But they also have a community. When you go to the WordPress.com front page, you'll see websites highlighted. You'll see people talking. They've put my site up there from time to time. I have half a million people now following me. That's a community I wouldn't have had if I weren't on WordPress.com. I love WordPress.com. It is the best platform. Whether you want to create a personal blog, that's what I do. But it's great for your business site or both. You're going to make a big impact when you build your website on WordPress.com. Pick a template. Gets, it's about as easy to get started as possible. If you just click the Get Started button, pick from. they'll give you a simple starting point, and you just start going, and you'll see how easy it is. But as you get more sophisticated and you want more, they have hundreds of templates. You get built-in search engine optimization. You don't even have to know what that means. You just get it. Social sharing, so your your posts can show up uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, everywhere. In fact, I have there's an AMP plugin, which I turned on, so my stuff loads fast on mobile. You automatically get secure HTTP, HTTPS, which helps your ranking on Google and make sure your site is secure. It's all built in. And you're part of a community. And I love that, too. See why more websites run on WordPress than any other platform. 28% of the net. And a lot of very big publications, too. WordPress.com slash twit. Get started today with 15% 
off any new plan purchase. WordPress.com slash twit. I, I have to say I blog more. I'm really happy to be back uh, on WordPress. I just, the, the interface, everything, it just makes sense to me. It's very intuitive. And we've used it so much. I mean, yeah, we've, every, WordPress for, right. uh, we've written thousands of pieces on WordPress right, right now. Yeah. yeah. Kovac, what's, uh, what's BI on? We have a custom CMS. Ooh, is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I love it. Okay. Yeah, it's really stable. It's really customized. I, re to what I remember when, to do with it. when Vox did theirs, everybody said, that's a reason to go to work for Vox. Chorus is the name Chorus, of it, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah ours is called everybody. Viking. Viking. <laughs> it's called Viking? It's manly and yeah. scary. Okay. okay. The reason these guys care is because when you write your articles, you write it in the content management system, right? Or, or do you Usually, just, yeah. You fire up Notepad, write it, and then paste no, it. No, 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 no. You write it right in the CMS. No. Yeah. In the it depends. CMS. If it's something longer, like it's a longer profile or you know something that I'm working on for a long time, I'll do it in Google Docs first just because I'm scared that I'll get lost somewhere. <laughs> but for quick you know, one-off stories, yeah, write in the CMS. If it's more than like 1,500 words, I'll write it in GDocs with an outline. If it's less than that, in CMS, just like stream of consciousness. Because all the links it. and all the images and everything, you just put it in there. It's just a natural... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you know, yeah. Work if for it's a good CMS, it works yeah. very nice. I really want to play with Chorus, but no one from Vox will let me play with it, sadly, <laughs> so... You know, I have a feeling I sh you should ask a year later because everybody loves Slack no. until it became the biggest time sink in history, right? Do you guys have Slack here? No. No Slack. We use HipChat, which doesn't have animated GIFs. It doesn't have the Alex Trebek robot. It doesn't. So it's boring Slack. <laughs> yeah. If I, I, we, used to, we used Slack with our um, uh, development team when we did the website, and I typed, that's nice. And a Borat shows up going, that's a nice. <laughs> and it's like, stop it. <laughs> stop trying to make me fun and playful in a work environment. I'm trying to get work done. So I want a correction here. Not that I ever made the mistake, but the folks at Roomba said, we never said we're going to sell your data. Uh, the Roomba uh, vacuum, which maps your, or has the capability, I guess the room 900, the new one, has the capability of making a map. That's helpful because... For instance, when the Roomba runs out of power, it goes back to its battery, it can pick up where it left off because it knows your house. People were really up in arms because its CEO implied in an interview with Reuters that at some point they wanted to sell that mapping data to third parties. First of all, at the time, it didn't bother me that much. Who cares where my, somebody else knows where my sofa is in relationship to my table lamp? Like, what? <laughs> and people stretched, well, a burglar would then be able to break oh into your God. house and go swiftly. <laughs> like, people stretched. I mean, I understand it's private and, and you probably should control it. And Ruba did say we wouldn't sell it unless you said it was okay. We aren't doing it now. We're just, but they backed off completely now. They said it's, <laughs> it's not going to happen. That was a misunderstanding. We currently don't sell your data and we never intend to sell your data. What we were thinking, and maybe we won't do it now that we know, is we would share that data well, for instance, with other smart devices in your house, the Echo would love to know where there's furniture so that it would help shape the mic. Uh, your stereo system could shape the sound, the Apple Home Hub, which says it will shape the sound based on your room's acoustics. Would be nice for it to know there's something here, there's something there. Sure. I can understand that being a value. I don't know who else would want to know where your sofa is. Maybe if you're Ikea, you'd want to know, you know how big is too big or if you design if you're an interior designer like how do people like to there's easier ways to get that than through Roomba yeah. yeah yeah also like how many houses what percentage of houses actually own a Roomba and then they have to get the data sell it somehow and then it has to be leaked and then leaked to burglars who then figure it out pinpoint it to your house what? if you haven't moved <laughs> and then they break in and they don't they step on the cat they still don't know how fancy your TV or sofa is just that there's a sofa there or the, if you have like security and, in the house right. or, like or they don't it's not even all of the Roombas it was only the 900, the 900 series which is their most expensive right. one so all of these headlines were like Roombas your, oh. your robot is stealing your data and it's like how many people actually have those $800 super mapping robot vacuums not the like I had one and I got rid of it because so my Roomba, this is the most annoying thing you can think of. <laughs> it uh, it would not get back to the charger, so it would die midway. Oh no. Right? Okay, so you wake up in the morning, there's a Roomba in the middle of the carpet, like the dog did something. So you pick up the Roomba, it has a handle, and you put it back on the charger. But what I didn't know was the Roomba forgets date and time then and any programming. So you program the Roomba to work when you're at work or you know, not when you're not at three in the morning. 
So the Roomba <laughs> makes a, it makes a racket when it, it it plays a tune when it wakes up. Do -do 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 and then you hear it, zzzz. and then invariably my Roomba used to, for some reason, try to get under the hutch that it can't fit under. So it would get jammed, and then that's how I'd hear three in the morning, and I go, oh. da -da 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 -da. and then boom, 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 yeah. until I got up and said, no, Roomba. And put it back on the charger. This is the definition, by the way, of a first world problem. Okay, right. I admit. And I say that with love because my sister has a Roomba. And whenever I'm down at her house in Sunnyvale, it does that too, like 6 a.m. It's so annoying. And it wakes me up and I want to kick it, but I'm also trying to sleep. So so I finally took the Roomba and I, my wife found them. I put them, <laughs> I wedged them on the rear tires of the car in the garage, hoping she would accidentally drive over them. But she unfortunately found them before she did that and gave them away. There are easier ways to whack your iRobot. <laughs> I know, but Roomba. I was really, <laughs> oh, shoot, the Roomba got stuck under your tire. Oh, what a sad story. I mean, just, all right. She still talks longingly and, and wistfully about the when we used to have a Roomba. I don't understand it. DEFCON. Yes. Anyway, I just want everybody not to worry about the Roomba. On the other hand, there is a robot that can crack a safe and, and did it on the DEF CON stage in 30 minutes. It was one of those sentry safes that everybody probably has, you know, in, in your, it's a cheap safe. Uh, they built the robot. SparkFun did it. They sell the uh, products that they use to build the robot, like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 3D des designed. They bought, they didn't bring the safe to Vegas. It wasn't a special safe. They bought one in a store because they didn't want to take it on the airplane. Uh, the Roomba, uh, Roomba. <laughs> the repurposed Roomba was able to figure out uh, to eliminate because there's a million possibilities, but they were able to narrow it down to a thousand because apparently, a nice convenience factor, Sentry Safe puts a little notch on some of the numbers so you can, I guess, so, I don't know why, but they found that within 30 minutes they uh, were able to open up that safe. They said we were really happy that it opened up. It was one of the scariest things we've ever done. Lots of things could go wrong. And this was a very big audience. And that's why DEF CON's cool. Because yeah. people try stuff that may fail. It's not like an Apple event that we discussed earlier. It's so practiced, rehearsed, and slick. This is nerds on stage with like so, wires I, going everywhere. We invent this thing. Exactly. And <laughs> that's why it costs about $200. So cool. It's 3D printed. You can print different uh, parts to fit any combination safe. So just, I don't imagine this is a threat that burglars will bring this erector sets <laughs> around with them. But What are you doing there, sir? No, <laughs> absolutely nothing. This is totally unsuspicious. More to the point, uh, Ian Thompson's article in the register, it took DEF CON hackers minutes to pwn actual voting machines that were used in the last U.S. election. These are electronic uh, voting machines from Diebold. We've known those have had security issues, but also WinVote. Uh, and um, one other company, I'm going to try to find this. The, the win vote system still had the information. It was used in an election in the Commonwealth of Virginia, <gasps> County of Fairfax special election. This one was really easy to hack because it had Wi-Fi. <laughs> it had, why would a voting machine have Wi-Fi, you might ask? Well, so it could surf the internet. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, upload the votes. Upload and the votes. <laughs> it just sounds big about it. And... Eh, as long as, eh, as long as you're running Wi-Fi, might as well run Windows XP. No. Yes. Yes. So they used RDP, a well-known uh, flaw in Windows XP. <laughs> they used uh, Microsoft's remote desktop protocol just to hack right into that thing. No problem. Uh, there were bugs. Some of them were running OpenSSL, unpatched OpenSSL. So they used some were running Windows CE. Hmm? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> some had physical ports, you know, Ethernet jacks or USB ports you could just plug into. But I, my favorite is this WinVote machine from the Fairfax County special election. Uh, <laughs> Are we surprised these are so insecure? Because I feel like I'm kind of nodding my head going like, yep, there it is. Oh, XP, yep, real dumb. And One minute and 40 seconds later, Karsten Sherman had remote access to this voting machine. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was running Windows XP with auto run enabled. <laughs> <laughs> and it had the hard-coded password. Oh, my gosh. It had a hard-coded web password. So, first of all, web's crackable. But the <laughs> password is hard-coded, so if you learned it for one machine, you knew it for all. Uh, wow. This is an argument against democracy, I feel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but good news, intrusion would have been detected and logged. 
Uh, okay. And actually, the better news is this kind of information is really valuable in convincing registrars all over the country not to use uh, electronic voting machines with no paper trail because there's no way to validate the votes and to probably not have them connected to the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> any, Especially with a hard coded uh, Wi Fi hybrid. I mean, come whip. on. Whip. Ugh, this is uh, what else? Um, injecting code into mouse firmware? You couldn't tell if that was a euphemism or not. <laughs> <laughs> is this genetics or is this like a mouse I'm plugging into my PC? Um, they added their own. This was at the uh, Saturday morning talk. Mark Williams and Rob Stanley uh, walked through the process of adding their own custom code to a gaming mouse. Um, That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, retaining the full functionality, but just having a few extra features. You're using the Surface mouse there, I see. Not the uh, not a gaming mouse. No, yeah. I don't. It's probably hackable too. Yeah, probably. They're all. You know, we're just. Why saying. would you hack a mouse though? What are you gonna like? What what benefits could it be from? I don't know. Getting Let's access see. to my mouse. Yeah. Oh, pranks, he used dude. a Steel, Steel Series Sensei mouse. Good for pranks, especially during esports yeah. events. Oh no! If your team is cheating. playing and yeah, cheating. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to prank my coworker, not cheat at StarCraft yeah. Two. With a uh, twenty million dollar prize pool at the International Twenty Sixteen Tournament, you might want to. You know, might be some incentive to. Oh, Dota Two. Hack yeah. that other guy's mouse. Did you go up to that one? No. Um, we have a friend. Peter, who did. Peter Bright. Peter from, Bright. Uh, from yeah. Our second guy is a big Dota fan. He's a big fan. Dota Two. Yeah, fan. yeah, yeah. So he keeps me appraised of the sitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm now too old and boring to, to play games, sadly. Yeah. Just some destiny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? Destiny? Destiny. You play Destiny? Uh, yeah, Ryan Lawler got me on it. That's a game. Yeah, but that's, I, I don't play like, I don't like watch esports. You I go down like to the bodega. And, I go down to the bodega and play, yeah. exactly. <laughs> By the paper towels for Steve. Yeah. Yeah, destiny and paper towels. You heard of Broadpone. We've talked about this, uh, I think, on security now. This is a flaw in Broadcom. Uh, this is a fun one. It's a fun bug. This also is a, uh, part of a talk at uh, DEF CON. Uh, it's, uh, you could uh, take the Broadcom firmware, hack it in such a way that it then connects with all the other phones it can see and infects their firmware. So it's a replicating worm. And one billion devices, both Android and iOS, were vulnerable to it until... Early July and last week when Google and Apple issued patches. Last week, Apple fixed this. When are we going to get some good news on the security front? I feel like whenever I come on Twitter, it's like, well, here's all here's the, the good news. This was patched before it was revealed at Black Hat. Oh, okay. That is good. But, I mean, that is, imagine uh, replicating code that I put it on your phone and then everybody you come within contact with gets the bug and everyone, they this it would spread to those billion phones in no time. It's like that uh, shampoo ad. I, I Which, infected two friends, and they infected. I have not two seen friends. the shampoo ad. That's an old ad. Yeah, not, I don't know. I'm bringing up old stuff. I'm so old. <laughs> I am so old. You are um, not that old. You've been uh, over yeah. this before the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I sp think we could stop. You're spry. Flash is dead. Woohoo! <laughs> Finally. Finally. Well, I'm not dead yet. 2020. <laughs> oh, are you serious? It's that 2020. Far off? Well, you know, you got to degrade some systems and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it takes a I, while. I checked my speed because uh, I'm using Ethernet for the first time in this apartment. And I want to see what it was. Yeah. Bill speedtest.net. That was a flash box yeah. for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why that needed there's to no be. There's no I mean, in fact, there's tools now that will convert anything, in, almost anything in flash to HTML5. So I think it's, you know, appropriate that Adobe said, well, we're going to kill it in three years. You might want to start porting your stuff to HTML5. <laughs> We did a great roundup of like all of the old Flash games and like you know original like viral videos oh, yeah. that were on Flash from back in the day. What was that Pogo? Remember Pogo.com? No, is yeah. that still around? I bet it is, and I Probably bet it still Flash. uses Flash. <laughs> yep. Oh wow! This oh, is like the old bonus .com you want to play uh, Mahjong Escape? <gasps> sure, you do. Let's just play a little. It requires Flash Player and able to run Pogo games. <laughs> We recommend using the latest version of Internet Explorer 11. What? Oh, my God. <laughs> Not even Edge? So I can't actually play the game because I don't have Flash on this Windows machine. Pogo.com, it's still here. <laughs> and guess what? Your grandma's still using it. It's They're going to take away my Mahjong. Is Pogo just like web-based Zynga before Zynga? Yeah. Well, oh, Pogo, yeah. Pogo's been around yeah. forever. When did right? Pogo come out? There were a bunch of those. Oh, wow. Like 15 years ago? Yeah, 2002? Yeah. 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 All right. 
Well. <laughs> no, it's got to be older than that. All right, this is like the internet like archive episode. I like this. I gotta look. Addictive, I gotta... Addictivegames.com. I think it was another oh, good remember one. That one, yeah. That yeah. yeah. Candy stand. Went on that one a lot. Uh, oh, there's a lot of uh, disambiguation going on here. It's a lot of pogos on uh, a website featuring free online games. Here we go. Uh, it was uh, 1999. 1999. Electronic Arts owns it. It's owned by EA? That's yeah. nuts. Are you serious? Yeah. It used to be, it, well, some of them are Java, I guess, but most of them are Flash. Is Java still a thing, or is that gone too? I no, haven't Java heard still, Java in still some alive. Time. In fact, uh, more people program in Java than any other language. Well, now I just sound stupid. To this day. Oh, well. Well, who's really stupid here, they or you? Uh, I don't know enough to answer that Notice question, I so I'm going to vote me. the transitive verb correctly. Do you want five points? Yeah. You have ten points. I could have said them, but no, I said they. Okay, 15 points. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to get microchip implants, kids, so you can uh, use vending machines without any effort? I like oh. Apple Pay. Yeah, this is so dopey. <laughs> but the best, okay, so you all probably saw the TV news article about Three Square Market, a technology company in Wisconsin. Is there such a thing? The, no, I'm sorry, Wisconsin. That was mean. <laughs> that was rude. The well, cheese is offended. University of Madison, Wisconsin and Madison just got a half billion dollar payment from Apple for inventing some chip technology so right. of course anyway they're uh they're getting rfid the employees on tuesday <laughs> when they come in will be offered rfid chips they uh, have a little staple gun they go <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> the program is not mandatory but 50 out of 80 uh, employees have volunteered uh and uh they asked the ceo <laughs> Uh, by the way, the company that's providing this is from Sweden. Sweden. And its name is Biohacks International. So I, I, I think they, yeah, they already know. Biohacks, uh, Biohacks International. Um, now, remember, there were Mexican uh, diplomats who were getting these RFID chips, but that was because they were getting kidnapped and they just want to be identified after the remains were found. Okay, that's just sad. Uh, this is this is they say more for like paying for stuff or identifying you for the you know the card key when you come into the door. No, you know what I have in my back pocket most yeah, days my I badge. Think it's fine. Yeah. Like I'm not. What happens my, when you leave the company? Employer, sorry, Mike, go for it. What happens when you leave the company? What, are you going to get well, a new chip? They have for a, every company. You know those staple removers. <laughs> <laughs> Just pluck it. You have like I don't want to be programmed in the, the first RFID place. Chips? Yeah. If my boss said you can either stay here or you. Or you, you can stay and get a chip or leave. I would be like, all right, deuces, I'm out. I'm not, no, you can't, you don't get to inject things in my body. I'm already selling you my time. And Leo well, told me that's the most important thing. So yeah. no, you don't get There's more stuff. There's also the security issue because uh, it's easy to figure out what that ID is. It's encoded in an ID. And the, they asked, I, I think it was the CEO of the company, well, what about, you know, couldn't somebody pose, you know, steal the number, you know, get an RFID reader while your employee's drunk at the bar and steal his number again? He says, no, no. You don't have to worry. They're encrypted. <laughs> so what? Well, they there you go. They're encrypted. That's going to be soon. Watch. Mark my words. The new buzz phrase for security. It's encrypted. And you'll see it on potato chip bags and everything. And people will just go, oh, well, it's got to be. Lock up your chips, kids. It's got to be safe. <laughs> They're coming for your They're, barbecue lays. <laughs> my chips are encrypted. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to wrap this up. He is A-L-E-X, Alex, on Twitter. Uh, a, t a handle he got for mere pennies on the dollar. True, actually. And it's probably worth more. It's Yeah, people have offered me a lot of money for it. Yeah, A-L-E-X. But remember, Matt Honan got hacked because he had M-A-T. you got to be careful. I with got two factor turned on. Oh, good. Good yeah. man. Steve Kovac, K-O-V-A-C-H. He's at Steve Kovac on the Twitter, and you'll find him as a senior correspondent at Business Insider. Always a pleasure. Mike Murphy uses Roman numerals for his Twitter handle for reasons we don't fully understand. My name. Those are my initials. Oh, okay. M-C-W-M. I, I thought it meant you were born in 19... Well, W doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I was going to say, it breaks down pretty quickly. <laughs> it looks like a Roman numeral, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, thanks for joining us, Mike. I hope you enjoyed your uh, visit and come back soon, okay? It's great. Thanks yeah, for having great me. Great to have you. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. We do This Week in Tech every Sunday afternoon, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. Tune in live. You can be in the uh, chat room and help us with the research topics. Uh, IRC.twit.tv. Actually, the chat room is always great. They give me lots of good...
They write all my best lines. They write the title of the show most weeks, too. They will write the title of the show. Yeah, it's important. It's going to have something to do with Alex, I'm sure. Also, if you want to visit us in studio, we had a nice studio audience. They're only uh, half asleep now. Uh, they uh, just emailed tickets at twit.tv, and we put a very comfortable... Actually, you guys got stuck with a really uncomfortable chairs. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But at least it kept you alert. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, we also want to encourage you to subscribe to the show because if you subscribe, you'll be guaranteed every Monday morning to start your week with a nice, fresh, steaming twit. <laughs> <laughs> and who wouldn't want to start your day <laughs> That's gonna get cut. with a hot, fresh, steaming twit? Uh, thank you, everybody. If I said everything I need to say, thank you, Karsten Bonnie, for producing the show, Tanya Hall for booking it, John Slanina for standing there and making sure everything worked. There are people involved in this. Who's going to be editing it? Brian Burnett? From Brian Burnett for cutting out the dirty bits. If you didn't hear any dirty bits, he did his job. I'm Leo Laporte. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye. Dead silence. <laughs>